you. So priority two, strengthening climate resilience. Um, as we know, rising sea levels, more frequent intestines, test storms and ocean acidification are threatening the livelihoods and natural ecosystems of SIDS. In the Pacific, we know that countries like Tuvalu face external risk from rising sea levels. And the Caribbean is increasingly affected by stronger hurricanes. I'm not sure if much, uh, most of you would have noted Hurricane Irma. Um, just a few years ago, which caused a lot of catas catastrophic damage to Antigua and Barbuda in 2017. So a key um, ABAS initiative is the establishment of the SIDS Center of Excellence, which includes the SIDS Global Data Hub. This hub launched during SIDS 4 is designed to improve decision making and capacity building by providing a comprehensive data repository for SIDS. We will delve more into the SID Center of Excellence um, later in this presentation. Our next priority is ocean management and sustainable development. So many SIDs rely heavily on marine sources for livelihoods, food security, and economic stability. However, issues such as overfishing, pollution, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing present a lot of significant risk. For example, the Caribbean fisheries sector um, crucial for small economies like Grenada is being negatively impacted by IUU fishing, um, exacerbating economic vul vulnerabilities. The Abbas encourages the development of sustainable marine industries, including fisheries, marine tourism, and agriculture. The SID Center of Excellence can support the creation of marine protected areas and promote um, integrated coastal zone management. And then finally, the fourth priority is gender equality and inclusive societies. So the Abbas recognizes that gender equality and women's empowerment are essential for achieving economic growth and sustainable development in SIDS. For example, in the Pacific, women groups have been instrumental in leading local adaptation projects, particularly in agriculture and disaster risk management. Empowering women can lead to increased leadership roles and economic diversification, particularly in industries like renewable energy and the blue economy. Right, so now we'll just go briefly into the key challenges that SIDS face. Um, as it relates to the implementation of the Abbas. So the impacts of climate change from rising sea levels to extreme weather events, insufficient human and institutional capacity to manage projects, implement technologies and coordinate multi-sector responses, difficulty accessing concessional finance, reliance on external markets and limited fiscal space, um, limited resources for data collection, analysis and integration into policy making, hindering evidence-based planning. So as mentioned earlier, a key Abbas initiative is the establishment of the SIDS Center of Excellence, which includes the SIDS Global Data Hub. But before we delve into the SIDS Center of Excellence, I'd like to provide a bit of context. First, let's recall the Samoa pathway. This framework recognizes that incentives for innovation, entrepreneurship, and advancements in science and technology are essential drivers for sustainable development. To support efforts of small island developing states, the Samoa Pathway reaffirms our key commitment to strengthen the availability and accessibility of our data and statistical systems. Importantly, this commitment is rooted in our national priorities and unique circumstances. It also emphasizes the need um, for us to improve how we manage complex data systems, including geospatial platforms. To achieve this, the Samoa Pathway calls for launching new partnership initiatives or expanding existing ones. Additionally, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development highlights the urgency of enhancing capacity building support, particularly for, de for developing countries, LDCs, and SIDS. By 2020, the agenda aimed to significantly increase availability of high quality, timely, and reliable data. This includes data disaggregated by key factors such as income, gender, age, race, ethnicity, migratory status, disability, geographic location and other characteristics that are relevant to national context. Okay, so let's now fast forward to the center of excellence, which has three components. A state's global data hub, which supports decision-making through data analytics and visualization across all SIDS. 
Secondly, a technology innovation mechanism which fosters entrepreneurship and technology transfer, offering training and mentorship for sustainable development. And the third component is an island investment forum. This is a biennial event connecting SIDS with global investors, promoting sectors like renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. So in front of us, we have a diagram of the SID Center of Excellence, which highlights its core pillars and focus area guiding SIDS towards achieving resilient prosperity. The SID Center of Excellence serves as a critical hub for SIDS offering tailored solutions to help these nations address their unique challenges. The center operates through three main pillars, as I would have mentioned, the Global Data Hub, Technology and Innovation Mechanism, and the Island Investment Forum, each playing a very critical role in supporting resilience and sustainability for SIDS. So at the core this arm of the center is the Global Data Hub, which provides enhanced data analytics and insights. And as I would have mentioned, the technology and innovation mechanism fosters entrepreneurship and access to global resources. And the third pillar is the investment, the Island Investment Forum, which creates opportunity-driven conversations around program um, investment. And at the heart of the center's effort are key focus areas, um, just to go over them briefly, climate change adaptation and mitigation, economic empowerment, um, ocean benefit and sustainability, renewable energy, statistical enhancement and training, and sustainable development practices. So now let's go into each um, component of the center of excellence a bit more in depth. So the SIDS Global Data Hub, okay, just making sure. The SIDS Global Data Hub is a comprehensive repository and analytics center designed to support decision-making and policy development across all SIDS. It offers technical assistance and capacity building for national monitoring and reporting aligned with the new 10-year agenda framework, the SDGs and future global development goals. Through the data hub, countries will have greater access to data at subnational, national, regional, and global levels, enhancing transparency and availability of information. Policymakers will be able to benefit from tools that allow them to visualize data, monitor SID specific initiatives, identify key interlinkages, and make more informed decisions. These capabilities will contribute directly to both sustainable, social, and economic growth across all SIDs. And lastly, the Data Hub will also be able to strengthen statistical capacity through training and data management, ensuring that statistical development um, and departments and units across all states are fully equipped to meet future challenges. Next, we'll go into the technology and innovation mechanism. So the ITM serves as a crucial platform for promoting technology transfer and innovation across all SIDS. It offers training, mentorship, and resources specifically designed to empower entrepreneurs and startups in small island developing states uh, with the goal of fostering a culture of innovation and growth. Um, the ITM will also help SIDS to build their capacity in science, technology, policy, and innovation, which are very essential for the structural transformation of our economies. Um, this capacity building will enable these countries to pursue sustainable development goals more effectively, creating lasting economic resilience. Um, furthermore, the ITM will also facilitate technology transfer across our SIDS, serving as a technology depository. Um, by working with the developed partners and tech giants, the ITM will also ensure that SIDS have access to technology that is relevant and fit for purpose. And now we go on to the Island Investment Forum. So the IIF, it is to be seen as a biannual event um, designed to highlight investment opportunities and foster dialogue among investors, entrepreneurs, and policymakers. The primary goal is to illuminate pathways for sustainable investments and collaboration while addressing the unique challenges of and needs of small island developing states. The, I, the IIF aims to continuously highlight technological and investment prospects within SIDS, ensuring that investments remain aligned with the evolving needs and demands of member states. It will respond to the changing needs, providing a platform for dialogue and investment opportunities that are both practical and future focused.
As we navigate the unique challenges um, faced by SIDS, the SIDS Center of Excellence stands a critical institution to address existing gaps and provide solutions to its three core um, components. So we'll go to each and how they can help to identify and provide solutions to some of our challenges and gaps. So first, the SIDS Global Data Hub plays a pivotal role by providing a platform for countries to share and collaborate on data collection. So as we know, many, fit, many SIDS sorry, face data gaps that hinder effective decision-making, but through this hub, we can fill those gaps and ensure that even the most resource-constrained countries have access to comprehensive data. Next, the Center of Excellence promotes innovative technologies in key areas such as renewable energy, agriculture, and disaster risk reduction. Um, by supporting the adoption of these technologies, the Center of Excellence helps SIDS to enhance food security, boost productivity, and adapt to the rapidly changing environmental conditions. So the integration of these technologies is not only vital um, for resilience, but also for driving the structural um, transformation needed to build sustainable economies in the face of climate change. Um, furthermore, the IIF, um, with the Island Investment Forum, SIDS can access critical financial resources and technical expertise. The IIF creates opportunities for countries to attract investment uh, for infrastructure development, climate change adaptation, and capacity building. This is essentially where SIDS can connect with global investors and stakeholders to drive projects necessary for long-term resilience and prosperity. So lastly, the Center of Excellence aims to host the SIDS Debt Sustainability Service Initiative, which will provide a tailored financial, financial support to help SIDS manage their debt burdens more effectively, ensuring that financial constraints do not hinder their path to sustainable development. So I'll go briefly into the need for global SIDS debt sustainability and investment support services. So let's address a critical issue affecting all of us, and that is debt. Right. As many of you know, SIDS face unique challenges, including economic vulnerabilities, exposure to natural disasters, and the ongoing impacts of climate change. And these factors make it essential for SIDS to access sustainable financial resources to support our development and our resilience. The purpose of this service is to essentially provide a solution to the challenges by focusing on debt sustainability and strategic investments that promote resilient prosperity for SIDS. Through this service, we aim to unlock much needed financial and technical support, enabling SIDS to strengthen their economies and adapt to an ever-changing global environment. So as we look forward to the future prosperity of SIDS, the need for a comprehensive approach to debt sustainability has never been much clearer. Our vision must go beyond short-term fixes and embrace a layered strategy that creates fiscal space, allowing us to address immediate challenges while investing in long-term development. Through insurance like anticipatory response mechanisms, we can safeguard our economies against further shocks, ensuring we are protected when disaster strikes. This proactive approach is crucial to maintaining stability in the face of climate-related risk. Equally important is also investing, investing in long-term resilience. By leveraging climate finance and innovative instruments such as blue and green bonds, we can channel resources towards projects that build sustainable climate resilience economies. And finally, legal advice and capacity building is very essential. With the right support, we can design investment products and negotiate debt terms that are both favorable and aligned with our development goals. So one of the key elements of the debt sustainability and investment support services is creating fiscal space to a layered approach to debt sustainability. This strategy ensures that small and developing states can manage debt while also investing in long-term growth and resilience. 
So we would want to focus on policy co um, coherence, ensuring that national fiscal policies align with global best practices for sustainable debt management. Stakeholder engagement as well is also a critical part of this, fostering collaboration among governments, financial institutions, and development partners to, see, to, in, to secure investments that promote economic stability and growth. The Debt Sustainability Support Services also plays a critical role in securing the future protection of small island developing states through a series of comprehensive measures. First, we facilitate risk pooling and help assess premium structures, allowing countries to share risk affordably. We also ensure that payout triggers are clearly defined, so when disasters strike, there is a reliable mechanism in place to provide timely financial relief. Um, the support will also extend to defining the scope of coverage, making sure essential areas such as infrastructure and livelihoods are protected. Furthermore, we would advocate for solutions to facilitate premium payments, ensuring that these protections are accessible to all. And then finally, the... Well, sorry, not finally, but the next um, crucial aspect of the DSS is to be a crucial partner in supporting resilience investment for small island developing states. This is where we would assist in strategic planning and project viability assessments to ensure that every investment contributes to long-term sustainability. Additionally, we would want to prioritize transparency and accountability measures to manage funds responsibly and as well as to maintain trust. And finally, um, the DSS will play a vital role in offering expert advisory and legal support to SIDS. Um, first, we would want to provide detailed assessments that uncover the complex intersection between debt and climate impacts, ensuring that our financial strategies address both. So the focus on developing local legal expertise ensures that SIDS are well equipped to negotiate debt, and investment agreements that align with their long-term goals. By leveraging collective political strength, we can advocate for policies that reflect the unique challenges faced by SIDS in the global financial discussions. Almost done. So now we'll go into our recommendations for national focal points. Great. So as national focal points, we should work closely with the DSS to strengthen national debt management strategies. This engagement will allow um, countries such as SIDS to access concessional financing and build capacity for sustainable debt management, ensuring long-term economic um, stability. Utilizing the SIDS data um, global data hub is also crucial for improving national data infrastructure, which we would have discussed yesterday. And if NFPs can also use this resource to enhance data collection and reporting on the SDGs, ensuring that national progress is effectively monitored and reported. NFPs should also collaborate with the SIDS Center of Excellence to integrate climate resilience and sustainable ocean economy strategies into our national development plans. This would help to essentially align national priorities uh, with global sustainability goals and foster economic growth that is both resilient and sustainable. As NFP, NFPs, we are also encouraged to promote approaches that are gender responsive and inclusive. This ensures that development strategies lead to equitable growth where all persons in society, particularly marginalized and vulnerable groups, can benefit from national policies as well as national initiatives. Um, essentially, by prioritizing regional partnerships, um, NFPs can share lessons learned and scale up successful interventions across SIDS. Um, collaborative efforts would also a, allow us um, as SIDS to build on each other's experiences and success, which will um, lead to more effective regional solutions to shared challenges. And to wrap up, I would like to say that the Antigua and Barbuda agenda for SIDS provides us a clear framework for achieving resilient prosperity for SIDS by 2034. So once we as national focal points can engage with tools like the Debt Sustainability Support Service and the SIDS Center of Excellence and collaborating with the international community, we can turn the Abbas vision into a reality. Let us continue to strengthen um, partnerships and empower each other as we move forward to ensure the resilience and sustainable development of our small island states.
And this ends my presentation. Thank you very much, Garth, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation uh, on the, you know, the context of the Center for Excellence, the three pillars, uh, and the services that it will be pro uh, providing. So now it's my pleasure to turn the floor to Mr. Bridge Thomas, uh, who's the policy coordinator uh, of the Office of the President of Palau. You have the floor. Um, thank you, Andy. Ali um, Ungituta, and good morning, Excellencies and colleagues. Like the presenters before me, I want to thank the government and the people of um, Vanuatu for the warm hospitality. Um, and I also want to thank um, our colleagues from the UN OHR LLS for all the arrangement and for bringing us all here to this beautiful island of um, Vanuatu. Um, my name is Bridge Thomas. I am based in the Policy and Planning uh, Unit in the Office of the President in Palau. And for my presentation today, um, I was uh, asked to focus on the oceans and the BBNJ agreement. As such, those are, uh, are the topics that I will be focusing on. So in my presentation, I will aim to address uh, these uh, three points that you see on the screen. Uh, and these are really like reflective on um, three of the guiding questions that were, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so um, in my presentation, I will aim to address these three uh, points that you see on the screen. And these are really reflected on the, um, um, three of the guiding questions that were provided in the uh, uh, concept note of the session. So the first one uh, being on the promotion of uh, sustainable blue economies in seeds, looking at some strategies and actions to ensure the long-term viability and sustainability of blue economy, of blue economies in seeds. Um, the second point is driving um, digital transformation, uh, particularly looking at some ideas for supporting SIDS, leverage digital technologies to accelerate development, enhance resilience and improve governance. And finally, looking at the ratification and implementation of the BBNJ agreement and the necessary support to enhance um, our capacities in its implementation. So while I was working on my presentation, I, I sort of had to answer uh, like this question myself. Uh, um, so why the ocean? <clears throat> so as SIDS, we are home to vibrant um, marine biodiversity. Um, the ocean is deeply intertwined with our livelihoods, cultures, and identities. And um, I guess just to share a Palauan perspective, we have uh, two main island groups. Uh, to the north, we have the big island of Babal Dhab, uh, that's Bab meaning upper, and Dhab meaning um, the ocean. And to the south, we have Yo Dhab with Yo uh, meaning lower, and Dhab, of course, meaning um, ocean. So that's already an indication of how much um, the ocean relates to our identity as a people. Um, as SIDS, we are stewards of the ocean. Uh, together, we manage 19.1% of the world's EEZs and the resources that live within these EEZs. And um, the ocean is our biggest carbon sink, and it is our biggest ally in our fight against climate change. Um, the ocean and its resources that we as uh, uh, SIDS are especially um, dependent on for our food security and livelihoods are under uh, considerable stress from anthropogenic sources. Um, and furthermore, our vulnerabilities are impacting our ability to protect uh, uh, this uh, shared ecosystem. And that is why it is important that oceans um, be an integral part of our dialogues, uh, specifically looking at how we can work with our partners to ensure a sustainable and effective um, ocean management. So um, 
This slide that you see on the screen looks at some of the ways to ensure the long-term viability and sustainability of blue economy in SIDS. Uh, um, so back home, um, we've been working on our enhanced NDCs, um, our NAPs and our NBSAPs. Uh, um, and a key focus has been ensuring integration among the indicators in these reports and plans to create a more coherent and effective climate action strategy. And that same focus sort of applies to the ocean as we are concurrently developing a sustainable ocean plan that will be unveiled next year and currently implementing a marine spatial planning process to prioritize conservation, domestic fishing zones and tourism sites. So, um, just what I attempted to, to do here was to create a matrix outlining um, uh, some strategies um, based on what do SIDS want uh, related to the ocean and the marine environment as outlined in the above? And um, these um, strategies are further um, sort of um, categorized into um, um, different categories, including sustainable fisheries, marine conservation, blue carbon, and ocean-based industries. And then um, also within this, um, um, matrix, um, what I attempted to do was link these strategies to various UN frameworks and conventions. Um, and I would, um, I think the purpose of this exercise was to um, address a point that was in the concept note of the session. And just to read it, it's policy coherence is critical to dealing with the main implementation challenges that sits face. And I think the Abbas um, implementation plan is is to um, is an opportunity to really prioritize the seamless coordination across different conventions and frameworks and and even like regional processes to really ensure that we are able to maximize on the opportunities that arise in these different uh, sort of processes. Um, in the interest of time, I like I'm not going to delve into the details of this matrix. The, um, it's uh, straightforward and pretty self-explanatory, and I think the materials of our meetings uh, will be shared with everybody else so you can have a look at it um, uh, when it's shared. Um, oops, sorry. And then I... I um, also like looked at some key areas for digital transformation in relation to the strategies that I just mentioned for promoting blue economy in SIDS. So um, the first one is um, data and information management. So investing in digital technologies to collect, analyze and share data on ocean resources, climate conditions and economic activities, um, developing um, data-driven decision-making tools to support sustainable management and, and resource allocation. The um, uh, second um, area is technology adoption. So pro promoting the adoption of innovative technologies to improve efficiency, reducing costs and enhancing sustainability in ocean-based industries. And I guess just to share an example, um, in Palau, one of our primary challenges as a, as a big ocean state, if I may put it that way, is ensuring effective uh, surveillance of our EEZ. Um, and, and this is due to limited personnel and high fuel costs for surveillance vessels. The technology offers a promising solution, um, but while, um, the, like, while the technology exists, the, the financing remains the critical barrier. And I uh, think through the Abbas, it's, it's an opportunity to explore with our partners um, collaboration with uh, external development partners to, to acquire these technologies. And then the last uh, uh, point um, is on capacity building, investing in training and capacity building programs to equip stakeholders with the skills and knowledge needed to effectively utilize digital technologies and drive sustainable development in the ocean-based uh, economy. Um, if we look at the previous slide uh, across the different um, 
um, across the different um, uh, frameworks and conventions. The, there are provisions within these frameworks that mention the use of technology within these different strategies. Uh, so now I will move on to um, the discussion on the BBNJ agreement. Uh, so on the screen is the table um, that I um, obtained from the High Seas Alliance website. Um, basically, um, it's a list of the countries that have ratified the High Seas Treaty. And for the treaty to enter into force, we need at least 60 ratifications by the UN Ocean Conference next year. So far, uh, like based on this list, the 13 countries have ratified the treaty with 10 of these countries being SIDS. I think that really signifies the importance of the ocean to SIDS. Um, having the SIDS been some of the first uh, um, ratifiers of the um, agreement. Uh, just more, um, more specifically on the SIDS, uh, again, there are 10 that have ratified, 18 that have signed but not have not yet ratified and 11 that have not taken action yet. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to get into any sort of political discussions, but I think it's a safe space to encourage the 18 that have signed to ratify and also the 11 uh, that have not taken any action. Um, just to share a brief history, uh, Palau was the first to ratify the treaty. Um, we wanted to be the first one to sign, but our sister nation of the Federated States of Micronesia beat us to that uh, in 2023. Um, and then I would just like to point out several reasons why ratifying the BBNJ. So uh, the first point is on the protection of marine biodiversity. Uh, the BBNJ agreement establishes a framework for the conservation and sustainable use of resources beyond national jurisdiction. And this is um, especially important for us because we rely heavily on, on, on unhealthy marine ecosystems for our livelihoods and well-being. The second point is on climate change mitigation. Um, the ocean plays a vital role in regulating uh, the Earth's climate. Uh, and by protecting um, marine biodiversity and addressing threats like pollution and overfishing, um, the BBNJ can contribute to climate change, our climate change mitigation efforts. Uh, the third point is, this, and is on sustainable development. Uh, the BBNJ. Sorry. I meant to show this slide when I was explaining the, the bits uh, that have ratified, have signed, but have not ratified, and then bits that have not taken any action as well. So um, just to continue on the, um, the reasons why it's important to, um, to ratify the BBNJ um, um, agreement. I think I've covered the first two um, points. And then the third one was unsustainable development. Um, the BBNJ agreement promotes the sustainable development by ensuring that the use of resources is balanced with the need to conserve uh, um, biodiversity. So again, that balance is very important for us in order to drive uh, truly uh, sustainable blue economies. Um, and this can help SIDS achieve their sustainable development goals and improve li the livelihoods of their people. The fourth point being um, benefit sharing. Um, the BBNJ agreement includes provisions for benefit sharing, which can help us access the benefits of um, marine genetic resources and ensure that um, we receive a fair share of the profits from using these resources. And then um, lastly, um, in this slide, the, the last point is on capacity building and technology transfer. Uh, the agreement provides for capacity building and technology transfer to support uh, 
uh, countries like ours in implementing the agreement and benefiting from its provisions. So um, just to share some examples of addressing the high seas in our region, perhaps these, uh, like, we haven't really started, we're still in the uh, stages of discussion and, and, and exploring uh, further capacity building um, opportunities for for SIDS uh, to implement the uh, treaty. But um, I think some of you may have already heard of this initiative, uh, specifically colleagues from uh, the SPC, because this is being led by the SPC as well as the colleagues from PIF. Um, this was launched, the Unlocking Blue Pacific Prosperity was launched um, in uh, COP28 by Pacific leaders. Uh, and among the things that it strives to uh, do is to facilitate a regional cooperation for the high seas, which the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner will take the lead on. And also, and also um, again, in line with the um, implementation of the BBNJ agreement, uh, uh, is the BBNJ First Movers, which was launched in um, New York in uh, just last month. Uh, and, and really it focuses on the urgency for the BBNJ ratification. Um, and the BBNJ agreement is crucial for ocean conservation and the sustainable use of, uh, of the resources. And ratification is urgently needed to achieve uh, the 30 by 30 goal and protect marine biodiversity. Um, and also it aims to create um, well-connected and biologically representative MPAs in the high seas, which is essential for achieving our, our shared uh, 30 by 30 goal. And also, um, and also developing high seas MPA proposals requires a, a collaborative um, action. I think that concludes my my presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bridge, for reiterating the importance of oceans to all of us, uh, and also the priority actions that we need to take uh, to protect and, and conserve the ocean. Uh, so colleagues, it's my pleasure to now hand over uh, to Mr. Dominic uh, Sofe, the Program Management Officer at UNOHRLS to make his presentation on the important issue of digitalization. You have the floor, Dominic. Good morning, everyone. Um, excellencies, uh, participants, and also before I begin, I would like to um, thank um, Onwatu government for the reception last night. I, I still think I am doped up from the cover last night, so bear with me. I will make this as fun as possible and as uh, informative as I can. Uh, today's presentation uh, will foc focus on digital connectivity and digitalization as key drivers uh, for achieving sustainable development in SIDS. Um, when I was preparing the presentation, I went and looked back at the Samoa pathway and I did a quick search of digital connectivity and it it, to, it wasn't a surprise when I didn't find one reference to it. Um, so having this focus in our bus uh, is a big ask uh, for SIDS and also it reflects how much important for sustainable development for SIDS. Um, looking at the SIDS context in a digital world, um, one of the special circumstances that characterizes SIDS or the vulnerabilities for SIDS is their isolation from the rest of the world and it has become a hindrance in their sustainable development. Now the cost of getting the necessary resources and services to the islands is high and just becomes one of the barriers for the development of SIDS. Uh, therefore, this is the cornerstone for the future development of SIDS. Thank you, Anya. Uh, you were connected there, so I was connecting with you, yes. And with 67% of the population connected, there is a significant progress um, being made in SIDS. 
but there are disparities um, that, that persist, uh, particularly in uh, smaller and more remote islands. And basic access uh, digitalization offers opportunities for economic diversification, enhancing resilience to climate change, and improving governance. Um, however, affordability and um, infrastructure gaps remain key challenges that must be addressed to unlock the full potentials of uh, digitalization. Uh, this is the map of the world's infrastructure connectivity. It was produced by ITU. And I don't know, it was interesting to see all those submarine cables along the ocean lines, ocean floors, just to see how massive the infrastructure that needs is needed for connectivity, especially for us SIDS and especially the remote islands. So it's, it was interesting. Um, now the key challenges that I wanted to touch upon for the SIDS, um, while it presents digitalization presents very, very important opportunities, um, there are significant challenges that still persist. Uh, I mentioned before the affordability, so there's a high cost of broadband and SIDS and it continues to limit the access, um, especially in rural and remote islands. Um, in addition, there's a growing need to develop the digital skills, uh, particularly for the underrepresented or the marginalized groups. Um, policy fragmentation remains a critical issue. The digital initiatives must be integrated across, across different sectors to ensure coherence. And now finally, there's a dire need for improved digital infrastructure across all SIDS, uh, especially in the small islands. And you see that there's uh, the lower internet usage, uh, particularly in rural areas, um, um, differs from the people in the, in the urban areas. Um, there's inadequate digital skills. Um, and then we talk about the persistent gender digital divide in SIDS. And this is something that we need to highlight when we talk about digital connectivity. To bridge these divides, our first priority must be we need to connect the unconnected. That's the first thing we need to do. And beyond access, we must also um, equip, uh, equip them with the necessary digital skills and the literacy to fully leverage the benefits of the internet and the digital world. And it requires innov innovative, scalable solutions uh, tailored to specific needs of SIDS. Now, Ambassador mentioned yesterday uh, the chapters of the, the ABAS. So I too uh, also want to touch on it very briefly in looking at a digital uh, lens. And what do SIDS want? And from the digital connectivity side of things, um, there's an ecosystem for growth. Significant challenges in, in building the ecosystem and the institutions necessary to fully leverage STI or science, technology and innovation. Um, there are these are the essential tools. Um, Garth has also mentioned the COE, SIDS Center of Excellence, as well as the touching on the technology and innovation mechanism, as well as the Island Investment Forum. Now, now speaking from an OHLLS perspective, we also have the SIDS Global Business Network Forum. That's also every two years, so it'll be it'll be important to see how these two. This is complement one another and to fully leverage what is needed from the business world to support the SIDS. And, and then we see strengthening e-government. Um, I understand it. I forgot the name of the, the, your plan that you have for a digital Tuvalu. Perhaps I'll putting you on the spot here later on for, to, to show us or tell us about it. Now, how do SIDS get there? Those are Vanuatu kids. I took the picture there when I was coming down here. I quickly put it in there. Digital cooperation. The digital technologies. Talk about us helping ourselves before we we ask our partners to help us, you know, and also for our partners to see that we are doing the work on the ground and makes investment come in three, four fold. speak about in, in or the whole of government that should be looked at as well, enabling policy environment along the same lines. And then capacity building and innovation. We heard um, 
Gopal speak about the need for building the capacity of the SIDS, and this is a, an important part of digitalization. We look at inclusive digital societies. Um, I mentioned briefly the gender, the digital divide that needs to be closed, that gap needs to close, especially in SIDS and among the different SIDS regions. Um, this is this picture here is I like this picture. This is the market in downtown in Port Vila, and just looks at the Abbas and the alignment with SDGs. Um, the two are closely aligned. Uh, for instance, the SDG eight highlight the importance of digital skills and capacities to drive economic growth, while uh, SDG nine focuses on infrastructure and seventeen on partnerships and effective implementation of digital initiatives require total growth. And the alignment of these goal, global frameworks to ensure sustainable outcomes for SIDS. Well, in the others, the SIDS story has been clear, right? In the aftermath of COVID-19, it was very clear that the digital infrastructure was necessary to keep the economy um, output going. That we were left behind during that period. So we're slowly coming back and we have our developed partners infrastructures in set for digital they were able to bounce back quickly. Um, some opportunities for transformation. As mentioned before, economic diversification um, it offers new pathways for SIDS. We look at e-tourism and how we can leverage that for SIDS. Part of our, our narrative, government services mentioned before. And climate resilience is an important one. Um, I don't want to pretend that I'm a climate expert, but I understand that the two go hand in hand in building the resilience that we need, and especially enhancing our disaster preparedness and global partnership. We cannot do this alone. Uh, we need our partners to help us. Very quickly, the role of the NFP uh, in this space. You know, um, you play a very important role as Ambassador Luteri mentioned yesterday. Um, suggesting that you, NFPs, become the champions of Abbas. And being the NFP, you are at the heart of driving digital transformation in the SIDS, um, coordinating the efforts at the national level, ensuring alignment uh, between digital policies and global frameworks as the SDGs uh, and the Abbas. And beyond coordination, you are also central in building the capacity within the country, um, the skills and infrastructure where we could link uh, the our regional commissions and our RCOs and MCO office come together to work with the NFP and see how we can bring the support that we need uh, through enhancing the digital connectivity on the ground. Uh, I've touched on these before, so I wouldn't go in again. Um, policy coherence, that's a picture of here in Vanuatu, I believe. Now, for the office, uh, OHRLLS, um, we're strengthening the support systems. Um, we co-chair the IACG together with DESA, and this is where we can bring in the entire UN system, UN development system, um, to find pathways and find all the avenues that we can to bring the digitalization connectivity to the SIDS and how we can help them. And we facilitate the collaborations with our RC and regional commissions, uh, mobilize resources um, where we come in with our partner to connect initiative where we, uh, our USG is uh, the a commissioner for the broadband commission. There have been pledges and I was speaking with Millie. For me to be done, the mic is done, oh, I'm back. Thank you very much.
very much, uh, Dominic, about reminding us about the the importance of connectivity, and you know, just sitting in Vanuatu and and the capital, you can see, you know, also what Vanuatu is experiencing with the the internet going uh, on and off, and and you know, just my experience in the Pacific, um, it very very much varies depending on which country you're in, uh, but also I think you know, and Dominic, you mentioned this. This is you know, it's one thing to be in the center of the country. But as you go further out, uh, it becomes uh, more challenging. And I think one of the issues uh, for us in the Pacific is just basic connectivity and particularly the last mile, uh, because that's where the, you know, and if you look at some of the, the countries variation, you know, we've got small atolls, but we have some countries which are quite mountainous. Uh, and so those are the people that are also uh, disadvantaged. So the presenters have done very well. Uh, we've still got about another 20 minutes before morning tea. So I thought um, we could, you know, have some some comments, questions uh, until we break for morning tea. Uh, I think it's important we do break for morning tea before we then do the second part, so everybody comes back fresh. So, uh, colleagues, the the floor is open if every, anybody wants to comment. Oh, right, all hands are going up. Everybody's awake today. <laughs> okay, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, from the Maldives, uh, I would like to share some uh, experiences that we have had. And uh, I would like to highlight, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, the capacity in processing data and engaging in uh, utilizing data for decision making. But another area that we really need to talk about is when we are talking about uh, uh, moving into digitalization as yes. The systems and the legal frameworks and the yes, infrastructure yes, we need yes. to really uh, bring on the digitalization. And in the Maldives, we have had some experiences where we are uh, moving towards uh, more digital uh, yes. form of government and also uh, public services. And uh, one of the key areas of roadblocks that we are experiencing at the moment is uh, having the lack of relevant legal framework. So the frameworks are outdated. And uh, also uh, things like cybersecurity, we are working on uh, uh, bringing on the legislature that is required. Yes. And also we have had a, a, a positive experience of COVID, I must say that it was a transformational opportunity for us to really move into e-platforms, uh, both uh, for service provision uh, for the public, as well as health, education, and this kind of uh, uh, sectors as well. And uh, we've been working for like past uh, 10, 15 years to bring these changes and investing in uh, skills building and infrastructure uh, for it but it was being it was finding it difficult that to make the behavioral change in the people but the uh, the covid facilitated this jump or shift in uh, transforming uh, our uh, systems into more e uh, and wide, more widely accepted by the people and one area that we um, uh, progressively did uh, well was the e-banking system. So now we already ha we have more people using the uh, e-banking and then uh, normal uh, transitions. And this has brought about uh, a lot of SMEs uh, in place. And then we have seen sm it, it benefited the small and medium-sized businesses very much. And this again called for more legal uh, uh, legal frameworks uh, such as copyright laws and uh, intellectual property rights laws. And then now we are uh, moving into the international arena. Like we are always talking about seeds, about uh, broadening our economy, diversification and all that. But we really need to have these laws in place if we want to probably... Uh, uh, be operating in an international uh, arena as well. So these are things that we are currently working on. And uh, with the, the e-government, I think we have reached quite an advanced level where we have we don't have any, all, all government or state 
payments has to be through an online portal. So we don't have uh, uh, money transactions within the government. And uh, I think this is what uh, Dominic was referring to about uh, policy coherence, where we all need to really align all the um, all the um, sectors need to align uh, where so now we have implemented where all subsidies and all um, uh, assistance by the government would be through e-portals and also digitally dispersed. So there's more transparency and more accountability integrated uh, into as well. And then we're talking about the digital divide here uh, as well. And then surprisingly, we have seen that women are taking on to be in more higher education because of the change in online uh, teaching facilities that's established now. So people uh, who are with children has uh, picked up on uh, uh, being engaged in higher education more and they've enrolled in courses. And uh, that that's a fantastic, uh, I think, a change that we have brought in. But for it to happen, we had lots of investments in the systems and in the necessary infrastructure, like the broadband internet, and we have been working on it for like 10 or 15 years already. So it was the digital transformation was easier when the time came in to change into these platforms. And as you understand, the biggest uh, problem in SIDS is the disparity and uh, also disbursement of people. So things like telemedicine are catching up in my country. And then, as I said, mentioned COVID like really facilitated and forced people to like really take on this, uh, bring in the behavior change. And uh, I think people are sticking to it. And that's uh, some lessons that uh, I would want to share with the other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now give the floor, I think it was Barbados, then maybe, oh, oh, sorry, it's Cuba. Cuba and then the UK, and then if we have time, we'll come to you. Yes, good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, recognize the presentation of all the panelists. I have only uh, one comment, one suggestion, and one question. A suggestion, first of all, I would like to recognize the government of Antigua and Barbuda to put forward this center of excellence during the uh, Antigua and Barbuda conference. And I think it was a very important step. And all of us now have to work together in order that the center fulfill what we want. So regarding the, the center, I would like to propose maybe by uh, the, the, that the office of OHRLLS and maybe through the regional committees, commissions, to have a kind of workshop to the member state in order they know how, how we can engage with the center, what support they need from us. I think it's going to be important in order to understand the work of, of the center, uh, because it's very challenging the work that seeing the, all the scope that you have is, is going to be very challenging. And I think that you need also the support of member state. Regarding the, the data collection, I have a, a, a question. How do you foresee to collect the data? Is through the statistical office of the country, through the uh, statistical division of the United Nations, through both of them? So this is uh, because I think it's important that all the data that you have have to be validated by governments. So for us, this is very important. And I would like to know how do you plan to do this? Maybe we'll we'll um, go to the UK and then we can then have a wrap up with all the presenters if they want to just ask. Okay, so UK. Hi. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I thought these were incredibly interesting presentations. Actually, I really enjoyed all of them. It was really useful. So thank you very much. Um, and there are a lot of things I may ask you all about um, later. But just a couple of quick questions. Um, one of them, actually, I thought um, on tech, on digital connectivity, I'm extremely interested in technological innovation and what we can do as a donor to try to promote more in that area to support um, SIDS development. And so I'm just very interested in your ideas about that. And you didn't mention, I thought your maps and everything were really interesting, but you didn't at all mention um, satellite connectivity 
or also artificial intelligence. I don't think anybody's talked about that at all. It's probably the first meeting in 2024 when nobody's been talking about it, actually. Um, but I noticed that um, Prime Minister Motley, in one of her presentations at UNGA, she talked about her fear that it would create more of a divide as developing countries got left behind as AI developed. So I'm interested in whether you've um, just thought about that, if that's something that you're sort of bringing into um, these ideas about connectivity. And on the center of excellence, I'd just be interested if there's anything that you could say about um, how you're looking at donors interacting with it and what the funding um, model is that um, that you have. Thank you. Thank you. So my suggestion is we I'll go give the floor to Mauritius far more. Uh, <laughs> okay, so we're gonna run out of time. Um, so can I just ask? Okay, so far more than then uh, Mauritius, and then I'll give the panelists the chance to respond. And maybe if you hold fire till the next session, if that's okay, yeah. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Just uh, a few points. Um, firstly, I'm trying to make the connection uh, between this uh, session and what we need to do moving forward. I think when you look at the the areas that have been identified or the key areas, I think we're going to be very clear in terms of what this means going forward. When you look at the ABAS, there's 10 action clusters. Three of those can be termed as cross-cutting in nature. These are, of course, data science, technology, innovation, digitization, and then the issue of partnership. And I think what we need to do is to be very clear in terms of where we're going with this. Because, for example, the discussion on the center of excellence is something that took place at the regional level, at the inter-regional level, it went through the um, G77 and the intergovernmental uh, negotiation. So we, we basically uh, agree on the principles. You know, what we need to, to finalize are the details. How many people will manage the center, et cetera, et cetera. So why I'm raising this is that we need to be clear that you know, the principles in terms of the three areas of focus as well has been agreed. It has been agreed. So, you know, I, I'm i trying to connect how we, you know, the outcome of this in terms of the process uh, moving forward. So that's the, the first uh, comment that I wish to make. And I think the the discussion this uh, morning is very much on some of those cross-cutting issues. The only one that I haven't heard is is on partnership, because we've we've heard data quite a lot, and I think the discussion around the global data hub is very important as well in terms of how that will pan out and how that is going to be managed uh, moving forward, and the connection between the global data hub, SIDS data hub, and the national and regional organization or institutions that are responsible for data in our countries. The second uh, point I wish to make relates to ocean. Um, I, I think this is uh, an extremely important uh, sort of priority for uh, SITS. But I, I wonder, uh, Madam Chair, in terms of our focus, um, I think it would have been uh, perhaps uh, opportune to hear from our national focal points in terms of how do we see the ocean and what are the possible action. Uh, for example, the health of the ocean. I, I think we want to make sure that's a top priority. Uh, and therefore the connection with that is that we have the plastic pollution negotiation sets on the way. Now, how you know can we get into that space? Because it's very important for us. 
So those are the things, you know, uh, illegal, uh, unreported, uh, unregulated fishing. Again, that is part of what we need to look at in terms of our economic, uh, you know, prosperity. And then I, I just finished by saying that one of the key, two key uh, action clusters deal with people. You know, uh, the uh, safe and secure society, for example, uh, and prosperous uh, society. I raise that because I think at the end of the day, I go back to the point that I made, that it's all about our people on the ground and what we need to focus on. You know, all these things where there's connectivity, it's geared towards helping them, you know, manage the challenge that they face on the ground. So I just want to raise those uh, points and try to make the connection so that we're clear in terms of the process as we uh, move forward. And thank you very much for all the presentation. Thank you, Ambassador. I'll now give the floor to Mauritius and then I'll ask the panelists to respond. Thank you and good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, I, I should also say that I thoroughly enjoyed all the three presentations this morning. Okay. <laughs> and um, to say also that um, how uh, uh, lucky we are to have uh, Ambassador Solomon as chair of AOS to be among us. Because one of the issues I, I wanted to raise was about the Center of Excellence and I think you address uh, most of my concerns. Um, but I was wondering, okay, we are talking about the center, but how at the end of the day is it going to be administered? How is it going to be financed over time? Uh, I think these are questions that we, we need to understand. And partnership, uh, which is a key word all along our bus, um, how does it, the center of excellence partners with other centers of excellence? I mean, in, in other regions, in all the cities, uh, like in Mauritius, we have a multidisciplinary center of excellence. And uh, I, I was looking at the Aruba center of excellence on cities. I mean, we have a whole uh, list of uh, centers of excellence. So how um, the the one uh, envisage in Abbas uh, going to uh, network and uh, collaborate with this um, I think uh, probably when we, we move along with time, we'll, we'll discuss and uh, uh, develop those um, even more. Um, and uh, uh, Dominic, I think your presentation was uh, among the most important because SIDS connectivity, maritime connectivity, air connectivity is already a challenge. I mean, sometimes um, Maldives is uh, next door, but going to Maldives, I have to travel to Dubai and then to probably to Maldives or to, to India, somewhere in Delhi or Mumbai. And so that, that is an issue. But digital connectivity, which is increasingly becoming important if we want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, connected to, uh, to the world. Um, my friend from uh, Maldives did share her experience about um, a country. I think we all have such experiences to share, but that is only possible if we are connected to the outside world. And now uh, for Mauritius, um, in terms of cable, I think we have just two table, uh, two cables, major cables connecting Mauritius. And uh, fortunately, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes you have those cables, one of the cables uh, is damaged and we have connectivity issue. So uh, connecting I seeds to the world, that is an issue. I mean, it's about, we are talking about massive uh, funding, I understand. And then um, uh, our friend from the UK did it, he raised that uh, issue of connectivity, satellite connectivity. So uh, we have to probably elaborate on that also. And on, on BBNJ, um, uh, our friend from Palau, I think he emphasized uh, enough uh, that uh, we as SIDS uh, should be at the forefront of the implementation of BBNJ and 
how are we going to talk about implementation if we don't sign and ratify? And I, I think uh, I, I've seen Commonwealth Secretariat circulating some survey forms. I don't know how many of uh, us uh, have received that because mo many of, of us are also members of uh, Commonwealth. Uh, talking about capacity building for signature and ratification. And I, I, I believe that Commonwealth area can, can be and is already uh, an important partner that we should be also working with. And uh, uh, I think I forgot to mention Commonwealth yesterday. I, I take this opportunity to, to, to highlight that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will now give the opportunity uh, to the panelists and I'll just give it, give them in the order that they uh, presented. So Garth. All right, thank you everyone for your questions and comments. I will do my best to respond um, to the ones directed to the Center of Excellence. Um, I noted my colleague from Cuba, I think you had the first question um, in terms of if the Center of Excellence, um, specifically the Global Data Hub, will be housing UN data or more national statistical data. Um, what I want to point out first is that before we can share data, we have to collect it. Uh, we saw yesterday um, when my colleague from the UN <laughs> um, showed us how the amount of data gaps that we have um, in terms of data that's available. I think what we first need to work on is what tools do we need to make available for us to collect the data that is missing, um, as well as making it presentable. I think once we can identify the tools that we need um, to help us in collecting our data um, that is needed, then we can work around um, specifically um, how what data do we share, um, especially some data is very sensitive. So we also have to look at how we can ensure that we're not, you know, um, given our data that is, you know, very sensitive. So I think we work at looking at the tools that we need uh, to collect our data, and then we would have to discuss, um, you know, as a collaborative effort, um, what data uh, we will share and where will it all come from. Um, I think um, from the United Kingdom, we had the question of how would the sense of excellence engage with donors, correct? Yes. So the... Sense of Excellence is supposed to, um, as I would have mentioned, house different key areas where we can develop a lot of collaborative and partnership efforts. I think in the Sense of Excellence, uh, we'll have to identify um, who are the main target donors in terms of um, providing us with financial assistance. Um, we know we have the Green Climate Fund, we have that adaptation from the Global Environment Facility. Um, I think we'll have to engage with them, uh, discuss uh, with them our priorities, our needs, as well as the streamlining of processes um, for us to be able to achieve a lot of um, the priorities that we have outlined in our Abbas. Um, Yes, I noted that from Ambassador and Marish. Ah, keep I keep pronouncing your name wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, Ma, Marishes, Marish. <laughs> um, yeah, I do agree in terms of we have to now focus on how do we get things in place and things together. I think right now what we are trying to do, as I was um speaking with um Tomasi uh, from the UN office, is we're now seeking to leverage a lot of financial and technical resources at this point to help with implementation of the SID Center of Excellence because we understand that SID Center of Excellence is supposed to be a very big and global hub for SIDS. And so it's going to require a lot of work, it's going to require a lot of financial support, a lot of technical support. So um, I do appreciate the comments and these are also areas that we are further looking into. Um, I'll give my other colleagues a chance to respond as well. Thank you. And you can also buttonhole Garth, of course, in the in between our sessions. Um, thank you for the comments. I think uh, for myself, I'll only, um, I guess, sort of react to the um, uh, UK um, in sort of a general uh, note. The, um, you asked what can development partners do? Um, just to share an example of, of what we are currently working on with our NDCs is the um, last year we reached our goal of uh, 
uh, 20% renewable in our uh, sort of our energy mix. Our next goal is 45%, if I'm not mistaken, by 2025. Now the struggle is uh, how to get there. Um, there's been a number of um, uh, plans and like studies formulated but then I think because of all of those plans, we're at a point of just like like analysis, paralysis, uh, like different partners, they come in and with their own sort of set of expertise and recommendations, uh, but then there's no sort of uh, a cohesive uh, plan on like this is the uh, best option for Palau and, and that we have to follow. So I think just coming to terms with our development partners on one sort of cohesive plan and also, um, and also, uh, like simply like deploying the technology to support the uh, um, islands uh, in um, accelerating uh, their energy transition and really just building resilience. Uh, thank you. If I may, moderator, thank you so much. Um, but thank you so much for the feedback and all the. Uh, interventions. I think it's it's really good to you know get the noggin thinking about the next session coming up, where we also look at partnerships. As uh, Ambassador Luteri has mentioned, uh, one of the important parts of the work that we do as SIDS, it's the only way we can move forward, um, especially being NFPs. But I wanted to just touch on um, UK's question um, for the AI part. I will divert it if you'll allow me. Um, Moderator to Tishka to give a little back. She's looking at me like, why are you doing this? <laughs> Don't blame me, blame the cover. Um, but I, I wanted to to just, you asked the question about how can the partners come in and support the work on digital connectivity? Um, well, through the ABAS is basically how I would answer it. Because the Abbas, even though it is a SID's own uh, roadmap, you know, it has a SID stamp on it, but it is an intergovernmentally negotiated document where the UK's issues were also reflected and they have a stake in it. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation about policy coherence, in the Abbas itself, um, in the section where it says, how do SIDs get there? And there's paragraphs that mention the assistance that the SIDS need in terms of, you know, um, developing national legislations around these digital connectivity issue, as Maldives has mentioned. You know, we can look at building the capacity of the different ministries or the agencies that deal with digital connectivity, but it goes back on the Abbas because it's what we agreed. It's not something that just the SIDS agreed. It's what SIDS agreed, what the development partners agreed, the international community, um, and it has the stake for for the CSOs to work, to use the ABAS to leverage the resources that they need to support the SIDS on the ground. And I'm looking at 3Link, because 3Link is in the room, and, they, and this is part of their work in Vanuatu. And so I'm hoping that 3Link is hearing, um, you know, what is actually needed and what is guided from the ABAS so that they can I don't know, I wouldn't want to say realign or refocus, but maybe magnify the work that they do, um, leaning towards the APAS and what is asked so that they can have the support from the, the partners on the ground as well and to go back to helping the people, which is part of why we are here and the APAS is for the next 10 years. On the satellite issue, I'll also lean back to Tishka because that is part of the AI. Tishka, you have the floor. I'm sorry. Here you go. Good. Good morning. Um, of course, I can't answer that question in fully. Um, I'm no AI expert, but I do know that through the work of the USGS Broadband Commissioner, she's working to um, find solutions and uh, pretty much scope the work around AI and its impact on most vulnerable countries. So as she's doing that work, we'll, of course, look at the ABAS and see how the, the the priorities align with the work we will be doing to carry forward AI and it, its impact. So as we get more information on that, I'll, we'll, we'll of course share that. It'll probably be 
a report that we can share online and uh, we'll keep you abreast of developments in that respect. Satellites, we'll have, again, I'll have to, <laughs> to get back on information on that um, for you. But also just to note that we have a, a consultant that been, has been working with us um, on digitalization in SIDS um, uh, in Pacific. We have it through the both all the regions, but the one who's worked on the specific, she will be speaking later in the set, next part of the session and perhaps can touch on those kinds of issues as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's probably an opportune time for us to have morning tea. So I'll hand over to our MC, Chief Organizer. <laughs> well, we're on fire this morning. Um... I, I was going to say uh, the, the kava has worked, but the, most people intervening today did not drink kava last night. So, um, yeah, I think it's perhaps a good thing you didn't drink kava. We'll have a, a quick 20-minute uh, break uh, now as uh, as uh, the, the, the presentations have been excellent so far. Um, please, uh, they will be shared online and the links will be, will be shared uh, at some point. Uh, by the uh, OHRLS team. Have a quick 20 minutes coffee break and then we'll come back for more uh, on this session. Um, Barbados, you'll have the floor as soon as we... Oh, did you... All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was just to add to what Tishka was saying um, and in response to the UK's um, question as it relates to AI and then obviously building on what Tishka said that we have the Global Digital Compact which um, is part of the Pact of the Future which also speaks to some AI issues um, and also some of the um, vulnerable countries such as SIDS and you know the possibility of AI as it relates to early warning systems, climate, agriculture, etc. So these are some things I think that Tishka and team would take on board. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karita. On that note, Tana Coffee is waiting for you. Making their way in. I realize that we've been very occupied. We'll be very occupied the last two days, uh, today, yesterday and today. And then also tomorrow, when we go to the field trip, <clears throat> you will spend the whole day outside and some of you will not have the opportunity to go to Villa sit town, Villa City, to Port Villa to have a look at the maybe say handicraft section. So what we'll do is we will arrange free transportation for uh, those wishing to go and do some last minute shopping. It'll leave here at eight o'clock uh, uh, on Thursday morning. And then at 10 o'clock uh, Thursday morning again, for two hours, you will be there. And then 10 o'clock, you will be picked up again to come back here. I am trying to arrange. I know that your checkout times here uh, is 11 o'clock. I'm trying to work with the management here to, um, to give you another extra hour so that you can check out at 12 p.m. And then you will, um, uh, the transportation will take you about 12.30 uh, bound for the airport. Uh, so I'm working with management. They need us because we give them business. So uh, so uh, I'm going to use whatever diplomatic skills I have left and my, uh, my bargaining chips to uh, make sure that you all have a 12 o'clock uh, checkout time. All right. And uh, Madam Moderator, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvan. So thank you, everybody, for coming back. Uh, and I hope you feel refreshed. Uh, you had some coffee, had something to eat. Um, so for the second segment uh, for this session, session three, uh, we'll be focusing on VNR preparation and mainstreaming ABAS. So let me uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, who's Kenethia Douglas, who, of course, you all know she is. She was also presenting yesterday. Uh, and Kenethi, of course, is the Senior Program Manager for Sustainable Development uh, Technical Cooperation Unit in the Ministry of Planning and Development of Trinidad and Tobago. You you have. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and good morning to colleagues. 
Um, I am going to start my presentation this morning by looking at what are the key lessons learned and best practices to promote coherence in implementation of the SIDS agenda and other global frameworks, including um, the SDGs. So the first thing um, on the, my list that we need to focus on is policy integration and alignment. And I think that some of the things that I'm going to cover are things that we've already been discussing and things that would have also been presented by other um, colleagues before. So this was just going to be for um, emphasis. So policy integration and alignment, we know that SIDS often struggle to balance the global goals and their own national priorities. So issues such as limited resources, the small economies, uh, vulnerabilities, external factors like climate change and economic instability are the things that make it difficult um, for us. So the best way forward is to create a national framework that aligns both the SDGs, other frameworks, and the SID-specific issues highlighted in the ABAS. So by ensuring policies across different sectors, such as climate adaptation and economic diversification are working together, we can also support progress in areas like poverty reduction, health, and gender equality. So another key factor is multi-stakeholder engagement. This was also mentioned before. So collaboration between governments, private sector, civil society, and international partners is a key for effective SDG implementation and implementation across other frameworks, especially um, the ABAS. So there are times that this sort of implementation is not always smooth. And one of the things that we can do to make sure that we are being effective in stakeholder engagement is encouraging participatory governance where all voices are heard. So that is especially our marginalized communities or marginalized groups, making sure that we are incorporating local, um, local communities or community groups or women groups or UN um, youth groups, sorry, and making sure that they are able to contribute towards the um, the process, and that is one way of making sure that it is inclusive and coherent. So also working on institutional coordination and capacity building. So the lack of strong institutional mechanisms and capacity is slowing down progress, especially when trying to coordinate across different sectors and ministries. So one of the things we definitely need to start working on is strengthening interministerial collaboration and ensuring consistent monitoring and reporting and making sure that we are building capacity. Sorry, I lost where it was. Give me one minute, sorry. So building capacity, making sure that efforts towards increasing the human resource, especially within those um, institutions, focusing on growing local expertise in policy design, data collection, program monitoring, and nurturing leadership um, within key institutions. So it's all well and good. And this is something that we have always talked to our um, development partners about is it's good when we receive technical assistance, but our technical assistance should also translate into knowledge sharing and transferring of knowledge so that the capacity within the institution or organization or the ministry that you're working with has that um, capacity that remains within the organization so that the next time around that we have to do is something like, say, for instance, a voluntary national review, instead of reaching out to the UN again for another consultant to help with the report, capacity was built within that particular ministry to do that on their own. So it reduces the dependency, builds the capacity, and creates stronger um, institution. So data monitoring and reporting. So as SIDS, uh, we are facing challenges with data collection. This is a topic that we've heard throughout all our discussions. And it's not just for SDGs, but it's across the different frameworks that we have to report on. And I would have mentioned yesterday that we 
Trinidad and Tobago is addressing this by building a more robust data system. And we're really hoping to incorporate the MNE framework for the ABAS um, into this. Uh, making sure that we are establishing integrated data platforms using digital technology and enhancing partnerships with international organizations for data-related capacity building. So when I mentioned yesterday about our data repository, that is one of the things that is going to help us improve our ability to be able to report and capture the data that is related for um, sustainable development. So this is also going to play a key role in our upcoming VNR reports. So the last thing under this um, particular topic is regional and global partnerships. So regional cooperation and support from global partners have already brought, brought sorry, um, significant benefits to SIDS, including Trinidad and Tobago. But I think there is still room for improvement, especially in reducing duplication of efforts. So utilizing regional platforms like the UN Multi-Country Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, that's the MSDCF. Um, it is for Dutch and English speaking Caribbean countries. So I'm sorry, lo siento, Cuba. <laughs> Um, can be a visible uh, platform for knowledge sharing, technical support, and collective action to help SIDS work together more um, effectively. So consideration can be given to establishing a community of practice or discussion forum for the Caribbean countries to engage, especially on the ABAS. So this is something that, Mr. Roach, you can take back to your RCs because I think... <laughs> Why are you laughing? We have to give them work to do. <laughs> because I, I think it's something we can make the MSDCF a little bit more practical for for countries. And if it is that the ABAS is something that we now have to take on board, I think we have to see how our existing frameworks and existing mechanisms can be utilized more um, effectively to give support where it is um, needed. So the other question that I'm going to tackle is how can the ABAS be mainstreamed in the VNR process and how can the UN system and other stakeholders um, support? So the mainstreaming activities I'm going to mention. So yesterday I would have also talked about how we're going to be including a chapter in the VNR report that is specific for the ABAS. So what we intend that chapter to highlight is lessons learned from the implementation of the Samoa pathway. So Trinidad and Tobago would have undertaken through the support of the UNRC office, a report on the national implementation of the Samoa pathway in Trinidad and Tobago. We got the support from the UN office to produce the report. The challenge that we've had why it hasn't been official as yet is getting the approval um, for it. So we're going through that process, but once we get our cabinet approval, we have a report that kind of lets us know where we have done well, where were the challenges, where were the gaps in terms of dealing with implementation of the Samoa pathway. So that is key lessons that we're going to be taking into what we have to set up and put in place for ABAS going forward. So as it's um the report would start would look at those um areas, help set the right foundation for achieving um the ABAS. So areas such as what are the key institutional and capacity gaps, um stakeholder coordination for implementation and monitoring and reporting tools and mechanisms will be elaborated because those things are important for um, implementation of the ABAS going forward. And the chapter will also touch on funding opportunities for programs and projects that can show progress toward achieving the targets that would be set out in the m and framework for the ABAS. So another point here is that it will also be important for partners such as the UN system 
other development partners to conduct an assessment of both the UN's joint program of work and, um, well, for in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, it's our government's public sector investment program to identify those initiatives that are aligned to the focus areas of the ABAS, because I think going forward, it would be important for us to be able to show what implementation is taking um, place on the ground and how it already aligns to some of the focus areas, because we can appreciate that work is um, already going on. It is continuing. We just need to be able to make the assessment to show that, okay, what we have been doing so far aligns with these particular um, focus areas, and then be able now to make, through the assessment, identify, okay, what other projects, programs, or initiatives we now need to implement as new um, programs to now treat with the areas that are not already being covered. Um, the UN system and development partners should also work on integrating the focus areas of the ABAS into their work programs and country results reports. So the UN, through the framework that I mentioned before, the MSDCF, they produce an annual country results report that shows how the joint program of work between government and the UN um, is, um, what are the achievements. So I think now this particular report, Mr. Roach again, I think now the, um, the country results report needs to start showing progress, not just for SDGs, but the, um, the ABAS as well. And I would also like to emphasize that when this re particular report is being done, that it should not just be a superficial report, but it should also be evidence-based. So to the extent that we can actually show evidence of the implementation and the progress, and it's not just all qualitative, but some sort of quantitative assessment as well. I hope you don't feel like I'm picking on you. <laughs> um, so what was not done so well, and I would have mentioned this yesterday as well, was how Trinidad and Tobago would have integrated the Samoa pathway into our national strategies, policies, and plans. So the sustainable agenda for SIDS and its program of action is not one that was publicly um, disseminated in Trinidad and Tobago, nor I think on a whole that the SIDS agenda has the publicity that the SDGs was able to command. And I think that this is something that we need to change. And I think as national focal points, this is something that we should commit to doing within our respective countries. So there must be a concerted effort to make us equal to the SDGs. And they must be both mentioned in the same sentence at the same time. One, you should not be having one conversation, um, a conversation about one without the other. At one of the panel discussions during the interregional preparatory meeting in Cabo Verde, looking at the operationalization of the SIDS outcome, ensuring localization and coherent implementation. I made a contribution which emphasized that we need to keep Abbas alive. So it needs to be part of the conversation in every forum, at every meeting, and highlighted in every speech. So we need to ensure that our political leaders are supporting the Abbas as well. And we also need to drive home to the international community. And this is us as SIDS that the ABAS is important to us and ensure that we are organizing ourselves as well to receive the support and also make full utilization of it. Another point on the mainstreaming activities here is cross-sectoral collaboration and coordination with national actors and the UN system during the VNR process, and that would help produce a more comprehensive report. So the question would have also asked what um, sort of support or how can the UN system and other stakeholders support? So specifically the UN 
system, um, technical assistance in the form of capacity building support to develop the necessary tools and expertise for integrating the focus areas of the ABAS into VNR reporting through workshops, training, or in an advisory capacity. The UN system's wide reach would be able to share global best practices and frameworks on how countries are using new programs of action in reporting processes. So it doesn't have to be how other countries are doing uh, VNR, but just anything else that is related to national reporting. What are some of the best practices that are being used in those countries that can be applicable? Um, Trinidad and Tobago has benefited from the UN's system financial and logistical support during the preparations of our VNR in 2020, and this was in the height of um, COVID-19 pandemic. So this partnership would have consisted of technical support for the preparation of the report, um, producing a statistical annex, and even hosting our stakeholder consultations, and even allowing us to use their multimedia facilities because at that time when we went, um, the whole world, world went online, a lot of us weren't prepared. But thankfully, the UNRC office in Trinidad and Tobago at the time had just installed multimedia facilities in anticipation for, um, you know, having to conduct business online now. And we were actually able to use those facilities to present our VNR virtually. So, this was a plug here to say that you all have with the UN, you all have been doing some good work. We are grateful and we, you know, hope that it um continues. So thank you. <laughs> no, I'm not finished. I was just saying <laughs> I was just telling the UN thanks. So other stakeholder support, so civil society has always been a key driver and the ones in the forefront in terms of implementation and even reporting on sustainable development initiatives. And uh, my colleague from Trinidad and Tobago, she would have mentioned the support that Canary would have given for um, our VNR process. And it was actually something that I did mention in um, my presentation for today, that we sometimes we don't realize how much um, civil society um, is an untapped resource that needs to be better utilized, especially in processes like the VNR, because they have a very strong voice. They're on the ground, they're doing the work, and they have information that we need. So when we had our first VNR report, we would have engaged the Caribbean Natural Resource Institute, who prepared a shadow VNR report and my colleague Wolf from Climate Analytics would have mentioned that yesterday, um, yesterday. So the work in the network on implementing initiatives related to the SDGs was featured in the country's VNR video presentation. And as we go forward, we're hoping to engage um, civil society organizations like Canary and other organizations on the ABAS as well. So the private sector in Trinidad and Tobago has been making strides and implementing initiatives toward integrating sustainability into their corporate portfolio and being more conscious about sustainability. So last year, 2023, the UNRC office would have partnered with a few com um, companies, Chamber of Commerce and associations to offer to the business community a guide to integrating and reporting environmental, social, and governance at the ESG for Trinidad and Tobago companies. So it was an initiative to raise awareness about sustainability responsibility. So the private sector was part of um, our engagement strategy during our VNR process. We would have had um, the consultant that was hired would have done interviews with private sector companies one-on-one, -on -one, and they were not, not 100% happy with the level of engagement from government and indicated a lack of awareness of government's specific sustainability initiatives. So looking forward, there is room for greater and continuous meaningful engagement during the VNR process with 
private sector organizations sharing what our government priorities with respect to what will be reported and work with them to collect data in line with international reporting standards for inclusion in the report. And now that we have the ABAS, this is also another opportunity for us to engage with them on this new um, program of action as well. Academia is a resource that has the capacity to support by providing research and analysis expertise and being an integral part of data collection and evidence-based assessments. So with their support, we ensure a whole of society approach to the VNR process. And I mentioned yesterday that we're really hoping to mobilize funding for a project that we want to do with um, the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine Campus, one of the um, offices there so that we can assist and use our local expertise, build capacity as well, because they want to support um, Trinidad and Tobago being um, achieving sustainable development. So recommendations for effective integration, um, integration, capacity building cannot be overemphasized as national focal points. We need this support. So strengthening our capacity to effectively coordinate and mainstream the ABAS nationally will ensure a comprehensive VNR report. Early partnership engagement between the government and the UN system, the multi-country offices, will be important for mapping and mainstreaming of the ABAS, assessing readiness and institutional mechanisms, identifying funding sources and other areas of need are some of the key activities that will be required. An area of improvement for us is in raising public awareness on SID's sustainable agenda with a focus on its program of action. So recognizing this, um, I'm hoping that Trinidad and Tobago would be able to put more greater um, efforts to include the others in the conversations that we're having with um, just nationally and within the national environment. Um, and treating it as a special part of our public awareness campaign, especially when we start doing um, our VNR. And I have a bonus recommendation, and I'm just throwing it out there, and I'm hoping OHRLS will catch it. <laughs> so I want to propose for consideration having, I know you have the SIDS Global Business Network Forum, and I'm wondering to what extent we can have SIDS National Business Network Forum. So using the Global Business Network Forum and localizing it, um, I think this could be a space for engaging the private sector and other interested stakeholders um, in the Abbas. Thank you, I'm now finished. Thank you so much, Kenethi. I mean, I, we can see that you've put a lot of thought in, into your presentation. Uh, and we appreciate, uh, you know, your presentation on coherence uh, and integration of ABAS, uh, but also sharing your experience uh, and then proposing, reflecting on the roles of the UN and, and other stakeholders and your experience in Trinidad and Tobago. And I will leave it up to my OHRS colleagues for the consideration of your recommendations. So um, it's now my pleasure, of course, to turn to our next uh, presenter. Uh, Juliet, uh, who we will be all very familiar with uh, from yesterday. Uh, Juliet, of course, is the head of the monitoring and evaluation unit of the Office of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu. So you have the floor, Juliet. Thank you, Madam Moderator, and good every good good everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for me to share some insights from Vanuatu. Um, I'm actually gonna focus my intervention uh, on maybe just two of the questions from the guiding list that we've given. Um, just some lessons learned and opportunities in implementing some of the best practices um, that we've seen uh, to promote coherence in implementing the SIDS agenda, but also um, I'll be looking a, a bit at the SIDS, sorry, the SDGs through our VNR process. And um, I will actually be focusing a lot of my presentation around uh, reporting and data. So if it's a little bit repetitive or um, an add-on to what Chris and some of the other speakers said yesterday, then 
um, I do apologize. So in July this year, we presented our second um, VNR at the HLPF, and our theme for the second VNR was around strengthening resilience through decentralization, which is, um, as you know, we're all SID states. We have a lot of scattered islands, and uh, in terms of service delivery, it can be quite challenging. And decentralization is a concept or a policy or program and, and a dream of us as a small island state to kind of further those efforts. So I think within the last um, five or six years, um, the last few administrations have really, really tried to push our efforts nationally to bring out decentralization and make that really forefront to what we're doing in terms of our development aspirations. Um, our National Sustainable Development Plan was developed in 2016, and uh, as part of this 15-year plan, we have five-year evaluation cycles. So we carried out a first evaluation um, of our NSDP in 2021, and as we were prepping for the second VNR this year, we thought about what we wanted to learn and what we actually wanted to apply from the outcomes of our second VNR. And so we were really thinking about what are the added benefits of conducting a second VNR? I mean, we you shouldn't, I'm a big believer in you shouldn't just be reporting for the sake of reporting. Otherwise, what's the point? It's a waste of money, it's a waste of time, and we're all really busy already. So we were really trying to encourage buy-in from all of our stakeholders and think about how can we make this second VNR and that journey and the process and the outcomes more meaningful. So in addition to doing all the normal usual prep that we've all gone through with doing VNRs, we decided that we would also do a bit of a, a data stock take on where we are with our NSDP indicators, but also um, with our related SDG indicators because we'd also localized our SDGs. We have 196 SDGs for our NSDP and we, we also report on around 185 um, SDG related indicators for our 15 goals. So as part of our VNR process, we carried out a data review uh, report. And so we worked very closely with our colleagues from the Vanuatu Bureau of Statistics to do a stock take of all of our national indicators and the, um, the related SDG indicators. And we were able to map everything out and also to update the tables and the NSDP portal that is housed with our Bureau of Statistics, which has all of our NSDP indicators and the corresponding SDG ones. So we really just wanted to find out as, as of 2024, March, where are we with everything? Where is everything housed? Um, what's missing? And also it was a really good opportunity for us to go back and have a look at our baseline um, data for all of our indicators and to see what's missing and what we could update because since, um, the NSDP came into effect in 2016. We've had a whole bunch of other um, national surveys and we've had census, we've had HICE, we just had the mix that was done um, 2023 and our latest uh, survey, sorry, our latest census was the agriculture census. And so we were really just trying to use that opportunity um, VNR, but you can kill more than one bird with one stone or something. I think that's the expression. So to kind of do everything all at once, because um, my motto is don't work harder, work slow. So I think we were really trying to see how we could do that and also pool our resources with where statistics were and they had some money to do that. And we also had a little bit of support for our VNR. So we thought, why don't we try and combine those things to see how we can, we can do that and we can have some really good outcomes as a result. So, um, while I know that I'm focusing a lot of this on the SDG indicators, I think it's a really timely opportunity for us to have that conversation because we are transitioning from the Samoa pathway into the Abbas and we are also thinking about streamlining and we've heard a lot of the other speakers have said that um, we want to actually build on what we have. So we're really trying to look at that in a very pragmatic way um, and just build on that approach that we've already taken in terms of localizing a lot of those global agendas into what we're doing at the national level and, and, and sub-national level. So I think just building on um, our VNR processes and also what we saw with the outcome of this data review report, I just wanted to share some of um, the lessons and maybe just provide some points that we can think on um, as we go forward with the ABBAS and the Yemeni framework. So I think my colleague has already mentioned a lot. She spoke uh, you know, quite eloquently about the need for aligning national reporting and policies 
to what we're doing at the sub-regional, regional level, but also the international platforms and partnerships. Um, and, you know, like other countries, we've also tried to look at how we can streamline our national data or national reporting to what we're doing at the global level as well. So um, I think it's really important to um, to support some of the, the words that our other colleagues have said since we came into this meeting. They've raised the importance of the commissions, the RCOs, and, you know, there's a lot of call for regional support um, and how regional agencies, including prop agencies, it's good to see PIFS is here, um, SPC was here yesterday, and um, MSG at the back, the role in supporting ABAS, building on best practices, um, also helping us to access and utilize appropriate technology that we can we can use, um, building on capacity, and also knowledge sharing and transfer is really important. We have a lot of resourceful people um, in all of our countries at different levels. It's it's just a question of how do you how do you get access to those people? How do you invite them to the table? Um, and how can their agencies and capabilities help to transform um, some of these things into you know actionable agendas for the future? So um, it's also really important in terms of how. Um, they can assist SIDS countries with, in terms of building reporting, but also in terms of data collection. Um, as long as it's based on relevancy, it, it looks at what our capacities are on the ground. And we have the ability to capture baseline information and metadata that speaks to our actual development um, agendas as well. Um, another example, and I don't wanna bore everybody because I know it's almost lunchtime, is the use of proxies. So, you know, one of the things that we have when we talk about indicators is sometimes there's no information available, you don't have baseline data. So instead of being able to measure something very specific, you would look at something that is quite closely related. Um, some of those things, and I'm talking very practically about some of the capacities that we might not have, and this is something or an area where um, perhaps we could see the... Um, regional organizations, the commissions as well, the um, RCOs coming in to, to further support SIDS. Um, yesterday in session two, we talked a lot about a potential core set of um, SIDS indicators for us to build upon. And this is probably something where we would also seek um, support or we could practically seek support from regional commissions and the um, RCO offices and the other crop agencies that are in the room. And it would be really great to see how we can turn that from maybe a conversation into things that are more tangible that we can um, even factor into a timeline, like one of the other NFPs mentioned in their presentation yesterday. I think something that I would also like to highlight here is around capacities. And uh, my colleague from Mauritius mentioned this slightly yesterday in one of his interventions, and it's something that we've thought a lot about. Uh, and maybe uh, going forward, we could if, it, if it's possible at all, this could be something that the IATF also considers in uh, in the timeline or in the scope of work that they're looking at. So when I'm talking about capacities, I, I guess I'm speaking specifically about the difference or the diversity between all the SIDS and just looking around the room here, we all have very different capacities in terms of human resources. We have some countries where they have huge statistics offices or they have big planning offices or they have a lot of people and then other countries in this region where there's one or two people and that's the entire stats office. So I guess in terms of how we practically and pragmatically look at what an m and &E framework should be like, we should also take some time to have a bit of a stock take or think about what the different SIDS capabilities are, not just by sub-region, but also country to country and how we're actually going to be able to manage things. And then kind of factoring that into our planning on what um, an m and &E framework would be like. So I, I think maybe that could be something that if the um, the IATF and, and how, we, how we design our m and &E framework, we could also be thinking about um, what the SIDS capabilities are and how we could uh, factor that in. This could also be an area that we might seek support through our um, regional agencies and uh, and crop agencies and regional commissions, not to put more work on you guys, but I mean, we are trying to talk a lot about what we mean by meaningful partnerships and, and how we actually do things in a very uh, actionable way. So, you know, these, these things, they sound simple. Um, they probably require a little bit of to and fro and, and, and collaborative efforts, but um, 
it, it's probably something that's a bit easier for us to achieve than some of the other things that we're talking about that are still at a very um, high level. And my last point, um, I think is, is really around the importance of supporting and enhancing national systems and building on the governance that um, countries try their best to develop. And I think it's 2024 now and just listening to some of the presentations that have come, especially from the NFPs and listening to a lot of the really good lessons and um, really positive developments that our respective countries have made um, to date with regards to policy, planning and reporting structures um, that really showcase and build on national capacities. You can see that there have been technological advances, there's innovation there, um, and there's also greater stakeholder engagement where there's really, really concerned efforts to to make that better, you know, and we're showcasing greater and meaningful stakeholder engagement participation. Um, and these are things that um, are wins for us. I mean, we are developing states, but in, in many ways, you can see that there's been a lot of progress. So I would just like to encourage us, and it's great to see that there are um, quite a few partners around the, in the room with us today, just in terms of when it comes to financing and resourcing for um, SIDS implementation and even SDGs, um, it's definitely an area where I would really like to see that our partners are able to build up, to build on those those support systems. Um, sometimes you don't necessarily need to come in and build a brand new database or a portal or a system. You can actually just have a look at what the Ministry of Finance has already done, what they're doing with that sort of data, and assist them specifically with what they might need. Because that's already costed, it's already part of their recurrent budget, they're already doing that, they have people in place, they just probably need a bit more help in some very specific areas. So I think just trying to encourage um, some of the, the ways that we can actually work together on implementation, um, having a look and, and really trying to support and enhancing um, national systems. And it's also really important because, um, you know, while it might not look fun or re it doesn't photograph as well, if you just have a picture of a um, a book versus, um, you know, cutting a ribbon on a bridge or something, which is also important, don't get me wrong, but I think it's also really important because um, investing in national systems um, are, are are important because they're built by and with our people. It also highlights that these are actually our capabilities. Um, these are the resources that we have. This is the context that we live in, including our climates, um, the ge different geographical um, nature of where we live, live and also our unique um, cultures. So um, I think if we're really talking about practical ways that we can start to make inroads to implementing um, the SIDS agenda, maybe this is probably something that we can we can have a look at. Um, so I think um, with that, Madam Chair, uh, that's, that's the end of my brief reflections and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Juliet, yep. uh, for your reflections, particularly sharing with us the experience of Vanuatu uh, and the need really for us, as you said, to be practical and not reinvent the wheel and, and work with what we already have. Um, so colleagues, we will have two lead discussions before we. I will open up uh, the floor for uh, discussions. Um, and our first lead discussant uh, is uh, Kenroy Roach, uh, who we all know, of course, from the UNRCO of Barbados uh, in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, so Ken, I will now give you the floor and just remind you, you have seven minutes. Testing. Thank you. Okay, I think it's um, very good. Thank you, Madam Moderator. It's a real privilege to be here, and I think my intervention is actually perfectly timed, given the into the last comments from Kenithia, um, tasking the resident coordinator office to do a number of very important things. Um, again, just to express the appreciation to uh, Vanuatu for the hospitality, 
and um, really to OHR LLS for showing leadership in, in, in bringing the resident coordinator system on board and, and engaged in this meeting. So thank you very much. Um, I, I want to focus a little bit in uh, on the sort of practical side of things, um, building a bit on what Ambassador Lucero said this morning and, and some of the recent comments. Um, so my comments are going to be more around how do we practically take the ABAS implementation forward and hopefully to put some proposals and some ideas uh, on the table that um, OHR LLS, but more importantly, the National Focal Point Network can consider in terms of how we how we move forward. The first thing I want to really note is that, um, you know, achieving the coherent implementation of ABAS, which has been a team well articulated in the concept note, will require a different way of working and it will require more collaboration and I would dare say leveraging more economies of scale simply because we're speaking about small island developing states with very limited capacities. And so I think um, as we go forward, we really need to think about how do we uh, bring the islands together more, bring their capacities more to do work more jointly. But that's also relevant for us in the UN system and, and looking at how we facilitate more integration and coherent policy advice from UN agencies, funds, and programs. So um, really thinking practically about how we come together and how we provide support to countries to deliver on, on the ABAS. And that, um, I, would, uh, I would argue, would require integrated and coherent um, tools, sustainable development policy tools that shows countries how we can really take forward many of the recommendations and many of those and the 10 areas that have been put forward um, in, in the ABAS. Um, the next slide. So one of the practical things that I wanted to suggest uh, in the spirit of this session, which focuses so much on effective practices and, and lessons learned, is really um, the UN system working together with each of the 38 SIDS to look at how to develop and integrate the ABAS into existing um, national plans and policies and, and systems. And, and the, the way, I, and, and this is built on the experience of how the UN came together on the SDGs. And I wanted to propose these six steps um, that we can look at through some, what I'm calling an integrated mission, meaning UN agencies coming together joining hands and working with each SID, bringing their capacities and comparative advantages together to look at uh, how to support landing the ABBA. So the first step really, and Kenichi, you spoke to this very well, is the alignment, which is an assessment of the extent to which the ABAS is already integrated into existing plans and strategies, because there are many things in the ABAS that countries are already working on. Um, there are many things in the ABAS that are deeply linked to the SDG agenda. So it's not that we are countries are starting from scratch. So the first place to start really is to take an account of where are countries with respect to the implementation of those commitments that have been made and identify those gaps. So I think an alignment exercise, bringing the collective capacities of agencies together would be a very uh, good place to start. And then secondly, looking at this important issue of how do you break down um, silos? How do you actually really help with the integration through coordination mechanisms at the national level? And what this really means is, and uh, again, the intervention from Trinidad spoke to this, looking at ways to build interministerial coordination, collaboration at the national level and looking at what are those mechanisms, but also other stakeholders. How do you bring other um, actors, private sector and, and other important actors on, to the table to look at how to support the implementation of the ABAS? And I think that's something that can be done very practically. And there are many examples of how that has been done uh, for, for example, an SDG implementation. The third is um, really moving from planning to action. and I. 
I wanted to come in after the presentation from um, Antigua on the SIT Center of Excellence um, and, and, the, and some of the comments made. I think there are many, again, there are many good ideas for what needs to be done. But then we also know in a resource constrained, fiscal constrained environment, there are perhaps some things that are accelerators. There are things that if you invest in those areas, you can have a domino effect across other um, objectives and targets. And I think the UN system can really look at supporting uh, the SIDS in identifying where are those entry points for delivering, turning the 10 um, sort of buckets or, or, or key areas for action into practical steps. Where are the accelerators that can be invested in at the national level? And then, of course, um, on financing, uh, we haven't talked uh, much about the integrated national financing frameworks, which is a very important tool for looking at fiscal space um, within countries, identifying uh, options for financing both international and domestic, public and private, and really helping SITS to think about the question of, okay, given those gaps that we've identified from the first exercise, and those accelerators or the priorities that need to now be addressed, how do we actually finance those needs? Uh, and again, looking at domestic resources, and there's a lot to be discussed in terms of domestic um, uh, financing, both from public and private, but also international public and, uh, and private. And I think the whole concept of um, partnerships that we'll be discussing to, uh, very soon will become an important element of that because it will give a clear indication to the international partners and where those gaps are and where their investments can best add value given um, the needs on the ground. The fifth element is on the monitoring and reporting. And, and we've talked a lot about this. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time um, strengthening data ecosystems, integrating ABAS into VNR reporting, I think is a brilliant idea. Um, but really looking at the existing reporting mechanisms and ensuring that as a matter of policy, ABAS and the reflection and with the development of the m &E framework and hopefully with closing some of the data gaps, which is why I included the strengthening the data ecosystem, because unless you have the data, you cannot really report on it. So the data um, system coupled with the reporting are some important elements and the regional commissions, for example, have a lot of experience around um, strengthening statistical systems that can be leveraged um, and other parts of the UN system, I, I would also add. And finally, the element of advocacy and partnership. And again, this has been coming up based on those gaps, what are the sort of partnerships that need to be thought of to, to take the um, ABAS forward. The other, um, the other part of this that I, as a final comment um, from, the, from my side. So as we all know, next year will be the financing, the fourth financing for development conference in Spain. And I believe firmly that there is a real opportunity given the work done around the MVI, given the thinking done around um, the financing for development needs of SIDS, for us to think about practically what are the, um, where are the interventions and where are the entry points for addressing some of those financing needs that can be brought um, to the um, Spain meeting. In the Eastern Caribbean, what you're seeing on the slide here is an attempt by the UN system, funds and programs coming together to think through how can the UN system support each country, each SID, in translating their financing needs? And um, we framed it more broadly around the SDGs and identified those four areas, um, policy and regulatory frameworks, capacity building, pipeline of national projects, and what and the last one, which we call convening the deal room with investors, commercial finance, uh, multilateral development banks, and IFIs. 
And if we go to the second slide, the next slide, um, we are proposing to do this in each country in three areas. And I think this is something we may want to look into more. This is just an example. Um, the first is around climate finance, looking at opportunities around um, providing technical assistance in developing um, the pipeline of projects, bank projects, supporting advocacy on the loss and damage fund and its capitalization, strengthening SID's knowledge on, the, on carbon markets and how to interact and engage in carbon markets, supporting SID's in getting national institutions accredited so that they can be able to access the GCF and some of the other funds, the vertical funds. Um, and in innovative finance, um, looking at opportunities around private equity, looking at opportunities around um, guarantees and, 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 and catalytic financing, looking at opportunities around green technology, fintech, agricultural insurance. These are areas where a number of UN agencies do have uh, capacity and have worked and could come together um, as part of this roadmap that I'm suggesting, this process that I'm suggesting to provide very targeted and um, practical assistance to SID so that we can open up access to um, innovative finance, but also climate finance. And it would, it would be remiss if I didn't mention public financial management, because this is an area we don't talk a lot about, but I think there is a need for support. Uh, issues around fiscal forecasting, issues around how do you structure blended financing arrangements, uh, obviously debt management strategies and so forth. And again, um, looking practically at providing this support. So I think um, to conclude, going back to where I started, true more integrated policy and technical support, bringing the entire system together to reduce the burden on SIDS to have to work with each entity at a time, but really coming together from the get-go, I think it's a really good opportunity for um, turning the ABAS and the objectives and the ambition of the ABAS into some practical steps. So I'll leave it there and i um, happy to interact more on these points. Thank you very much, uh, Kenroy. So we have our final uh, uh, discussant, and that and she will, is Ms. Suela Hansen, uh, who is, as I think uh, Tishka mentioned earlier, she's an OHRLS consultant uh, on digitalization. Uh, and uh, Suela will be presenting uh, online. So Suela, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we uh, can. Yes, Thank I you can. very much. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Can you see that? Is that visible? Okay, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm very sorry that I'm not um, there with you in, in Vanuatu, um, but it, it looks like you're having a really productive um, conference. So I undertook a study um, on behalf of um, the United Nations um, in Kiribati. And the objective of the study was to explore progress um, with introducing and adopting digital technologies and the remaining um, challenges for further advancement into the digital world. Um, I have to preface this um, presentation um, by saying that um, I didn't actually go to Kiribati. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't sufficient budget um, with this project to make a visit to Kiribati. Um, but fortunately, I had been um, to Kiribati um, on, a, on a World Bank project some years earlier. So I did um, have an understanding of, of the culture and um, some of the, the challenges that were, were facing the communications sector um, back then. So it, it 
it was interesting for me personally to see um, what changes had occurred over the last 10 years um, and um, particularly where things stood with the outer islands because my job 10 years ago with the World Bank was, was to cost an intervention um, in the outer islands um, to improve or, or to create um, communications channels which weren't there at all in some cases 10 years ago. So I looked at um, the digital supporting environment and there were three main areas I considered. First of all, um, the enabling framework. Secondly, um, access and connectivity. And thirdly, what digital initiatives were going on. Um, of course, for digital trans transformation, all of these elements are important. So just, just to put in, in context um, where um, Kiribati lies in comparison with um, Pacific neighbors and the SIDS average, this is uh, the percentage of individuals using the internet. And you'll see that um, the, the green bar is Kiribati, which is, is just over 50%. So significantly below the SIDS average and below many um, of the other countries um, of the other Pacific neighboring countries. As far as affordability is concerned, um, and this is ITU data again, um, broadband services are still relatively unaffordable in Kiribati compared to benchmarks and certainly compared to the Broadband Commission's 2% target. So you'll see that Kiribati is around about 5% um, of GNI um, being spent on broadband services. So not surprisingly, um, affordability um, remains a barrier for many in Kiribati. And um, just going back to Dominic's presentation earlier today, um, he emphasized the importance still of affordability. And, and sadly, that was an issue 10 years ago when I, when I was actually in Kiribati. Still, the price of devices um, is very high in relation to income there. Um, some people, um, if they don't have a job, they, they can't afford a device or um, a mobile service. However, there are, are some developments going on there. Um, there are two cable, submarine cable um, projects um, in the works. Uh, one has already landed in one of the island groups. There are three island groups and they're very, very widely dispersed geographically. So one has landed already in Kiramati and um, another one is coming next year to the main center in South Tarawa. So it's, it's hoped that with those submarine cables coming um, online, the cost of bandwidth is going to decline. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, new um, improved satellite service options are becoming available now. And um, again, there is a hope that with increasing competition, um, the cost of bandwidth is going to decline. Now, looking at the enabling environment um, for digital transformation in Kiribati, um, it was clear that since 2019, a lot of progress has been made. Um, there are um, strategies and plans, action plans that have been drawn up and um, put, into, put into practice and also um, associated legislation has been passed to support um, appropriate governance for digital development. Um, most importantly, a digital transformation office has been set up and that acts as a, a center of excellence. It's uh, its main um, responsibility at the moment is to guide um, digital initiatives, particularly in relation to e-government, so initiatives in the public service. Um, but it's also, um, encouragingly, um, 
being engaged in community outreach to promote digital literacy and knowledge. I spoke to many government ministries in the course of the study and public organizations. All of them um, are still at a relatively early stage in the um, movement towards digitalization. Um, and some of the um, sectors are still actually um, at the planning stage only. So there, there's a, a long way to go, but what impressed me was that there was a really strong understanding of what the opportunities um, that digitalization um, and digital development can bring. Um, that was clear in, in most departments I spoke to, most ministries. Um, there was an appreciation of the improvements in efficiency and competitiveness, and not just in a general sense, but very specific um, ideas about how this would help in their ministries. Um, and also, of course, um, a very good understanding of, of the possibilities for economic and social well-being um, through digital development. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there is um, there are improvements coming with with connectivity, um, and this is a, a real precondition for digital transformation. The submarine cables will make a difference. That that they are key milestones, as I've described there. Um, but at the same time, um, the outer islands will never have cables um, realistically. So they will continue to rely on satellite and in some instance, microwave services. Um, so someone mentioned earlier um, uh, that no one had, had, had talked about satellite, um, but I want to emphasize that um, it, it's critical for these outer islands and Kiribati and many other Pacific islands, um, which will not, um, it's just not economic given their geographical circumstances and the demographics um, for them to have cable. Uh, finally, um, and this was a problem 10 years ago and it persists now, there's a lack of access to reliable power supply in many, many areas. And I'm not just talking about the uh, outer islands. Um, there were power, power outages in um, South Tarawa which is the main um, center, um, which took down the internet for a long period um, very recently. So th that is an ongoing problem, an ongoing challenge really. Um, not only is there uh, an unreliable power supply, but there's also an over-reliance on imported fuel. And that fuel um, often is irregular in its supply, particularly to the outer island. So that's that's an ongoing challenge. Now, I, I, as I said, I spoke to um, many um, ministries and agencies, and I just thought I'd, I'd touch on um, fisheries because this is um, absolutely key in terms of the economic well-being in Kiribati. It's one of their, it is their main industry, fisheries. So in the fisheries um, department there, the government has a lot of um, digital initiatives and plans. Um, they are at the moment developing a digital licensing system, which will support up-to-date data. And as part of that, they will have a modeling and forecasting capacity. And then they have many hopes and plans and aspirations for digital um, initiatives, including um, the use of blockchain technology, which they see as, as being able to improve their efficiencies within the supply chain. And also um, they have hopes of using that to develop aquaculture. They want to build internal reporting capabilities and they want to adopt digital platforms that'll facilitate effective cross-sectoral engagement in the blue economy. So these last three points are really um, aspirations rather than what's happening at the moment. So what are the main challenges um, they are facing in, in implementing and accessing these types of initiatives? The number one one was the in, inadequate digital infrastructure. 
Um, and they are, they are all hoping that will be solved when the cable arrives in Tarawa. But the other big one, and, and this has already been talked about quite a lot um, today already, is the lack of human capacity. So it was clear um, that they there is a need there to train staff and colleagues in new digital systems and applications. And secondly, um, there was recognition that they didn't have the required expertise in the country um, to establish the systems which they want to establish um, and to put in place um, all of these uh, initiatives. So in other words, a technical expertise is required from outside um, in order to provide the training and capacity building which will support these initiatives. So finally, um, how can um, Kiribati's participation in the digital world be advanced? It was very clear that further technical assistance for training government staff in new digital tools and applications is absolutely essential. So that's at the government level. But I, I also spoke to many in the private sector and it, it became clear that for, the, for those individuals and groups, programs are necessary to create opportunities to improve digital literacy and skills which are important for digital inclusion. Um, at the moment, Kiribati is still largely um, a paper-based and cash um, economy. So that's the, the transactions um, are usually conducted this way. And in order to, to take advantage of digital solutions, it's necessary to build digital trust so people are, are happy to move from those traditional ways of doing business. And finally, the promotion of digital initiatives, particularly relating to e-commerce, um, will be pivotal in advancing the new opportunities um, which digital transformation offers. Now, I didn't mention explicitly um, uh, NFPs, but I have to say that um, without the NFP, um, in Kiribati, I would not have been able to conduct the study remotely. Um, it just would have been impossible. That NFP in Kiribati um, was excellent with communications and she was able to quickly identify um, who I needed to speak to um, and, and set up meetings, um, follow up for me. Um, so um, full credit to that NFP and I came to appreciate the value of NFPs um, through the efforts of that, um, that good lady in Kiribati. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say. Um, I hope that was useful um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. about the challenges we still continue to face uh, in some of our member countries. So colleagues, uh, we are, we have about 15 minutes officially before lunch, but with your indulgence, depending on the interest, maybe we can break for lunch. I'm looking at our chief organizer <laughs> at quarter to one, uh, but as I said, we'll judge the, the interest in, in uh, the discussion. So the floor is, is open. Uh, please, you know, put your sign up and then we will around the room. So the first, uh, thanks, Vanuatu private sector, thank I'd like to take this opportunity to um, uh, give my opinion of uh, what has worked for us in Vanuatu and um, um, the progress that we can move forward. I will be uh, uh, giving an intervention in the afternoon, so I will uh, uh, continue more in depth there. Um, one thing that I wanted to note is that um, 
the ITU has uh, indicated that the first uh, infrastructure that needs to be put forth is the digital infrastructure for connectivity. And uh, that being set forth, then the other SDGs can catch up to it. Um, next, I also like to say that, for example, UNCDF has put forth a study for Vanuatu in which e-money, if implemented, can immediately improve our GDP by one to two percent. So that is a twenty million US dollar translation for us every year. So that's very meaningful for connectivity in our island. What I've learned is uh, when I have uh, uh, started uh, Three Link uh, in twenty twenty was that uh, uh, connectivity was really important to be put in the remote islands, but it needs three pillars. It needs not just broadband, uh, but also it needs content, and uh, it needs um, another pillar, which is uh, uh, the sustainability of the community to maintain this connectivity. And so this is really important for the data collection or participation, especially in the informal sector. Uh, Vanuatu is agriculture-based, and also for ecotourism, uh, a lot of uh, data can be collected by local uh, micro um, entrepreneurs. And um, so I'd like to just reiterate that if we do make a step forward uh, today, I, we've mentioned uh, data, we've mentioned uh, infrastructure, uh, but a lot of these have legal implications that stop the progress. For example, connectivity is actually ruled by the licensing of every nation. So not everyone can be a player, for example. And big telcos have their particular um, uh, responsibility to their shareholders. So that needs to be navigated. It's the licensing. The next is uh, in terms of data. Um, we need the data scientists to be able to uh, ethically navigate uh, what is data that we can collect uh, that will populate the fields that we need and uh, we have these off-shelf products that are already available um, that we don't have to reinvent. So this is not a dream, it's actually available. So with the use of AI, and uh, we could even, our youth <laughs> with the connectivity and capacity training, they could build agents to then you know, further create or seek data um, that uh, really, um, substantiate um, their particular needs in their country. Because every SIDS nation, we are in different development paths and we have different development needs. Uh, the Pacific SIDS, we really do need that connectivity and it seems oversimplified, uh, but that is our first step forward. So thank you. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, just giving others time to collect their thoughts. Um, just wanted to say that note has been taken of the um, challenges given to OHRLS from both Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the RCO office, Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. Um, we, this is what this meeting is for, to care these um, suggestions and recommendations. Can, you can, okay, and see how best we can take them forward. So this will all be um, a part of our discussions going forward and taking note of, of, of the very useful comments and um, recommendations that you have made. Um, so th th we, will, we will be working on and just wanted to say that. And, and hopefully, in, as I speak, others um, can come with their thoughts and recommendations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tushka. I'm just checking. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I was particularly um, impressed uh, by, by the presentation made by uh, all of the colleagues here, but in particular, um, the one by the, the discussant, Dr. Hansen. And um, I, I noted the use of uh, blockchain and digital technology in uh, the management of our fisheries resources. I think this is something that uh, we uh, 
it's possible we should be able to to share as we all want to develop our fisheries and ocean resources in a sustainable manner and make the most of what we have. I mean, we, we talk about IUU at the FAO. We even talk about the IUU at the WTO, uh, you know, the fisheries subsidy agreement. Uh, so uh, um, I, I would uh, request our last speaker, if possible, to, to share a bit more about uh, what uh, uh, she has done on uh, on on, on uh, the use of uh, blockchain and digital technology, um, I, I think I noted uh, in the management of supply chain, aquaculture, and reporting. But it it's also about uh, IUU. I think uh, that's very important. Talk, she did mention about e licensing system. Um, so I, I would be uh, very grateful if. If you could uh, share a bit more. So, Sue Ellen, are you still on? Sue Ellen? Yeah. So, just, just before I give her the floor, just to let you know that I know, for example, and unfortunately there's nobody here from Fiji, but that Fiji has been using the, the blockchain technology. And there's a local company that's basically developed, uh, it's quite useful. And uh, we also do have a, in the Pacific a foreign fisheries agency who helps with, you know, IUU. Um, and they have a very uh, good uh, vessel monitoring system, uh, you know, which is pretty impressive. So um, I'm just looking. So is did you want um, so, uh, did you want uh, Suella to respond now, or for her to just share something online about the blockchain technology? Yeah. So maybe I'll ask Suella to just you know share with OHRLS the the blockchain technology so that other people in the room can also have the opportunity, uh, you know, to, to speak. Okay. Carry on, please. Yeah. Thank you, Madam. I just wanted to come in and uh, uh, I totally agree that um, the infrastructure and, and and it has a ripple effect, effect on the other industries as well. And I would like to highlight the point that um, uh, when it comes to technology and the transformation, uh, private sector plays a key role in uh, bringing up the ch about the change because they are always looking into efficiency and making it more effective. But that's where the government comes in to support and complement these initiatives and uh, support, uh, help uh, build on what they are uh, pushing for, especially uh, when it comes to e-commerce and uh, things like that. So government is more of a facilitator and uh, it's a, they should like jump in to the um, initiatives driven by the, uh, and the private sector. So like what we have seen in the Maldives is like where the SMEs uh, are more easily adaptable to these e-commerce, smaller businesses uh, or more, um, uh, adaptable to the these changes where larger uh, businesses were not able to easily change to the transaction. So these kind of things uh, uh, we really need, uh, we really see things that we really didn't com uh, totally uh, predict how this would work. And uh, also uh, uh, the legal systems and the, I couldn't agree more on that. And of course, the challenges of uh, integration and also uh, digital literacy, all these are coming in. So government really needs to uh, make intervention, timely interventions to uh, uh, address these issues that uh, really come in place or fill the gaps that uh, the private sector is not able to uh, carry on. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that as well. And investing in technology is as important as investing in other infrastructure as well. And it really would have a ripple effect on the industries like health, education, uh, and many more agriculture, fisheries, uh, all that as well. Thank you. Just checking if anybody else would like to speak. Um, if not, I know that we have people online that have also put their hands up. 
So I just want to check before we go online. Okay. So, Jish, if you're still online, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you, Mod. Thank you, moderator. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge the very good presentations made by speakers in this session. Um, I, I, I wanted to just I'll highlight, just highlight. Um, a, a few points, if that's okay. Uh, mainly to say that, um, as as my as our colleague uh, Ken Roy Roke said. We're not starting from scratch uh, and a lot of work in the Pacific Seeds have been done to integrate and localize the MDGs and the SDGs, as well as some more pathway before uh, a bus. And um, I'd like to also suggest, say that the six steps highlighted by um, Mr. Roach was helpful because these are the points that have been identified as accelerators for the SDGs, and they also can be applied in the case of a bus. So um, just to give some examples of some work SCAP's done uh, to support the UN offer uh, as, a, as, a, as part of the UN offer uh, to support Pacific Seeds, um, We've sort of worked a lot in the in area of integrated planning and alignment of the agendas. And one of the key areas of work has been, for example, ensuring there is coherence within the national planning processes, which include sector plans, corporate plans, and, even, and eventually the budget. So thank you, for, uh, Mr. Conroy, for also highlighting uh, the 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 need for that integration. Um, and the first three points on your six steps, six, first three steps of the six, uh, three steps of the six are uh, very much areas where SCAP's worked. For example, linking plans to budgets, SCAP in the Pacific Seeds has worked extensively with IMF and other partners to support strengthening those linkages. More recently, SCAP has worked in some countries, particularly uh, and I hope Vanuatu doesn't uh, mind uh, me mentioning, but we tailored the national planning framework also uh, to, to make sure that there is better um, efficiency and coherence. Uh, another area where I could mention, I wanted to mention work, uh, which Mr. Conroy highlighted was, you know, strengthening project planning systems and improving investment pipelines. We've got in both uh, this area as well as strengthening uh, linkages between plans and budgets, guidance notes specifically for Pacific seeds, uh, noting the capacity challenges in Pacific seeds. So I think it's been um, you know a lot of effort that's gone into a lot of these areas, and um, possibly we can share this with the secretariat um, just to 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 have as a resource as well. But these are very important areas of work, which um, I think eventually um, uh, could support better implementation um, as highlighted in Mr. Con uh, Mr. Roach's six steps. Uh, and, and, I, and I could say here also that it'd be good for uh, the UN system to strengthen the offer in the various sub-regions, including the Caribbean and PCs by, um, by having um, a kind of a consolidated um, offer from the various agencies so we can be more effective in our support. My last word on this, if I can, and, and maybe um, this may come up later, um, uh, but they'd be really good to have some consensus on the changes between the Samoa pathway and the bus. Uh, that will help a lot of the countries, but also the partners to to identify clear entry points that need integration. Uh, as we said before, we're not starting from scratch. So a lot of the Samoa pathway issues may have been integrated already. So it'd be really good to understand what are the clear entry points uh, that need further integration um, within the planning framework and, and the budgets eventually. Um, these will lead to better implementation and, of course, better results. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the opportunity.
speak? Seems not. I think we're all eager to have lunch. So I'll hand over to our chief organizer again, Silver. Okay, thank you very much, um, Madam Moderator. Please give her, everyone a round of applause. Um, so good news. All of you staying here are checking out at 12 o'clock. Yay. So um, I told you we had soft power. Um, so we'll break for lunch now, and then we'll report back at, uh, say, quarter to two, and then we'll make a two o'clock uh, prop star. Um, so enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Lunch will be served at the same uh, the same restaurant. Most of you had your breakfast, not or not. I hope uh, we are well fed enough to take us across to the last stretch of our today workshop before we close. Um, just one uh, um, house, uh, just an announcement. Um, I do understand that there are there are a couple of um, a few vegetarians and a few pescatarians in the room. So if you have any dietary um, needs for our day tomorrow, for lunch tomorrow, please let me know. I have ordered four uh, uh, vegetarians and four fish for those who are pescatarians for tomorrow. They are, I mean, of course, if um, if there are leftovers, others can eat it, but, um, but I've just ordered it just in case um, um, anyone needs to... Uh, we 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 haven't accounted for any vegetarians or any other pescatarians. So we've if you have any dietary needs for tomorrow, let me know and we can arrange for your for for special meals to be prepared. I um without further ado, I am going to hand over to our moderator for the last session, uh, Mr. Kenroy Roach to take us through a uh, board session. Mr. Roach, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back uh, for the final session for today. Um, I hope everyone had a good lunch and we were energized. I think you're in for quite a treat um, with this session. Um, so my name is uh, Ken Roy Roach. Um, the, as you know already, I'm the head of the UN Resident Coordinator's Office for Barbados and Eastern Caribbean. Uh, this session is um, session four, Strengthening National uh, Focal Points uh, Partnerships. So we're going to focus heavily on, on partnerships, which you know already has been highlighted in the ABAS, and we've been referring to it in the discussions uh, yesterday and today as an important element for delivering on the ABAS. Um, I'm delighted to moderate this session where we will delve into the critical aspects of the ABAS and um, how to develop, as I said, those partnerships. Um, partnerships offer the opportunity to bridge sectors, harness diverse expertise, and mobilize resources to achieve shared goals. Um, the session will focus on how national focal points can forge stronger partnerships across government, civil society, the private sector, academia, international development partners, the media, and many others. So we'll hear from an esteemed panel who have successfully navigated these partnerships and who will share valuable insights on how we can turn partnerships and recommendations from these partnerships into actionable initiatives. I think I wanted to say um, at the get-go from my perspective, as we look into the uh, full implementation of the ABAS, it's important to connect the notion of partnerships with a discussion on the means of implementation. And I think already from the conversations we've had uh, that really I think eliminated, uh, il illuminated, sorry, the need for focusing on how to help SIDS deal with the capacity challenges. Definitely, um, we should be thinking about how partnerships can bring those um, inputs or those means, uh, the means for implementation. 
And as you know well already, um, some of those include um, partnerships for institutional building and capacity development, ensuring that there is institutional quality, which we know is important. Um, partnerships for strengthening uh, national statistical systems to ensure that robust monitoring evaluation frameworks are in place at a national level um, to inform decision making. Uh, partnerships for uh, technology transfer and digital transformation, ensuring that both the private sector and the public sector acquire digital and technological tools necessary to leapfrog their productive systems and advance the digital transformation agenda and partnerships for financing to deliver on, on those 10 core areas of, of the ABAS. So those are just some, but I'm sure the panel will be exploring those and other means and other mechanisms and ways of de delivering on partnerships. So they will dig deeper and share how their work are already contributing to building durable symbiotic partnerships for SIDS. We'll explore best practices for building capacity and communicating the impact of our efforts to stakeholders. I look forward to a fruitful discussion, as I'm sure you do, and hearing your ideas on how we can all work together to foster partnerships with and for national focal points that will turn support um, implement that will in turn support the implementation of the ABAS and create lasting positive changes for um, small island states. So let me introduce um, the panelists. We have this afternoon, uh, Ms. Rebecca Fabrizzi, who you've met already, special envoy for, to my immediate left, special envoy for SIDS of the United Kingdom. Uh, to Rebecca's left, uh, Ms. Gabriella Casola, Ministry for Foreign Affairs and European Affairs and Trade of Malta. Uh, to my right, um, Mili Ojden, founder and CEO. Mili, where is Mili? I don't see. She, we know she's around, but she'll join this panel. Uh, founder and CEO of TreeLink Vanuatu Trade Commissioner to California. Um, Sasha Jettinsane, a loss and damage expert with Climate Analytics. Uh, Ms. Juliette Hawka, Hawka, sorry. I don't see Juliet. Oh, Juliet is there. Yes, Juliet, who we also know very well, um, head of the Monitoring and Evaluation Unit of the Office of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu and Na National Focal Point. And of course, Damien Sass, who is the Sustainable Development Officer at UNOHR LLS. So those are the panelists this afternoon. Uh, we will start with the panelists giving uh, five minutes to each panelist for their intervention and with further um, ado I'll hand over to Rebecca. Thanks very much Kamoy. It's going to take me between five and ten minutes okay I'm just warning you. Um, so I'm kind of like the NFP for SIDS in the UK government. I think we're a bit unusual amongst big donors in having this role but I think it's great and I hope it'll be um, a trend. Um, if for us, it illustrates the fact our government decided a few years ago to prioritise SIDS as a special case for development, recognising the particular vulnerability that we all know all about. And that's supported by particular interests from our government in many SIDS countries as Commonwealth members. And I mention that because, um, of course, many of us will be um, next week in summer, um, which including I'm going and Gabrielle well, um, and some more famous people like the King and Queen of England <laughs> and our Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary will be there too and I probably worth mentioning as well that our new Foreign Secretary because um, we have a new government and he has family and friends all over the Caribbean so is very well sensitized to SIDS issues himself. Um, with the new government our previous strategy for SIDS is sort of mothballed but um, it's probably worth being giving a little bit of context we'll be renewing it um, and we're going to take advantage of our ministers having been properly exposed to SIDS concerns, so at Chogham and COP, and with some bilateral visits. So our Commonwealth Minister went to Seychelles last week, and um, our Latin America and Caribbean Minister is in Jamaica right now, and she's going to the Bahamas this week as well. So um, they're getting a very good 
um, exposure to SIDS and all of the things that we've been talking about. Um, so our work has been organized around advocacy for SIDS. So in our own system and in international systems where the UK has got a useful platform and with other donors who don't necessarily share the same view of the priority. Um, and then policy initiatives. We had a landmark call for action on access to finance at COP26, um, principles for effective development impact in SIDS. And we don't make up policy for SIDS. So these were partnership projects with AOSIS and SIDS governments and other donors as well. So strong examples there of partnership. And then also we do programming with grant finance to support SIDS development. And it's complemented by other activities in our government benefiting SIDS. So most notable is probably work on reform of development finance systems, disaster risk financing and disaster risk reduction, work on ocean biodiversity and climate finance and net zero. Um, a recent strong example, I think, of partnership is our DAC SIDS partnership that we launched successfully at SIDS4 um, with Samara and Antigua and Barbuda. Um, I'm sure that you'll know that the DAC um, Development Assistance Committee governs rules around ODA and gives non-binding guidance on development to members of the committee. And we were concerned there that the DAC's approach to SIDS was quite conservative, not necessarily taking real account of SIDS context. And so we promoted the partnership as a way to make the DAC approach better informed. So we're now discussing how to take forward implementation, but without creating new bureaucratic burden. And this is an aim to improve focus by donors on SIDS priorities and to improve the impact of development. Um, so that's just a sort of brief overview of things that we've been doing just to give some context. Um, partnerships are essential for the delivery of every part of our work. So I'm gonna give a few more examples and ideas including thoughts for our role in implementing um, the ABAS. So first, I think it's important just to mention with um, the national focal points that we have a very big diplomatic footprint in SIDS. So we've got 12 diplomatic missions in the Caribbean. Um, I think we have seven in Pacific Island countries and also in Mauritius, Seychelles and Maldives as well. And I just mentioned them because um, you probably know them already, but their job is to work with you, with your governments, understand your priorities, and they're your port of call for UK support. So uh, some of them are quite big, you know, in Barbados, it's quite large, but some of them are very small. But they, even if they're very small, they know how to connect back into our system and to, um, to help you articulate your requests and interest in working with us as well. Um, We've got quite a vast array of development programming, but I'm just gonna mention a couple of things. So um, one thing that we've been working on is pilot programs on access to climate finance, which was another initiative that came out of COP26. And with this, we've got embedded climate finance advisors across certain governments, including in Fiji, um, Mauritius and Jamaica. Um, so earlier this year, uh, we were also thinking about what we were going to do with our um, program on building climate resilient infrastructure in the Caribbean, which is a program that's been going for about nine years now across about um, eight Caribbean countries um, to build sort of climate resilient um, roads and ports and so on. Um, and this will wind up quite soon. We wanted to work on a plan to renew the program. Um, so we decided to, to sort of develop a program to use learning from the pilot program on access to climate finance that's happening in Jamaica to come up with a new kind of system. So a sort of collaborative activity with the government of Jamaica and with climate funds, but with an aim to create a new kind of platform where we will use grant financing to eliminate barriers and reduce risks and enable private investments so that we can use our grant funding to leverage many multiples of um, private investment in to build a lot more climate resilient infrastructure. Um, so our funding announcement for this was 200 million pounds. And the idea is it should create many more multiples of that and hopefully be an effective model, um, which would, it, this will be in the Caribbean, but hopefully it will be an effective model that could be deployed elsewhere. So I was quite interested, actually, I think it was Juliet earlier saying that it can sound quite boring to sort of create a new system. And it's true that, you know, if you ask ministers if you can have 200 million pounds but they won't get a road to open or, or a new bridge like, you know, that they've built to look at. It can be quite difficult to sell that idea. But anyway, we managed that in the end. Um, we've got dedicated programming for SIDS, um, which is through two programs which offer technical assistance for capacity building, active in, in many of the countries here. So we've got um, one is dedicated to marine economies and one is more general. 
So an example there, here in Vanuatu and in six other Pacific Island countries, we've embedded climate finance advisors and governments to help with capacity support to access funds like the GCF. So that's a kind of triangular partnership arrangement with local governments and with um, GGGI who implement the project for us. Um, other important partnerships, for example, um, working with government of Barbados on global financial systems reform and our prime minister announced at UNGA that we will join the four Ps. Um, and we deliver regional assistance through regional organizations um, all across the SIDS regions, like 35Cs or CARTAC, PIFTAC, SPREP, um, regional development banks, GEF, Special Climate Change Fund, GCF, and so on. And also these partnerships with academia that um, Kenroy mentioned are important. And RESI for us is a really important partner. So um, we fund a lot of the work that RESI does as well. And of course, the UN as well. So it's sort of been our pleasure to um, to be big contributors to some of the UN activities for SIDS recently. Um, I mentioned yesterday it's important that SIDS don't just think of donors like the UK as being bilateral sources of funding, but also as change agents who can support and promote your objectives in organisations that matter, whether it's UN, World Bank, the DAC, <clears throat> and so on. Because we also we have our role there and our platform there, which is slightly different from yours, but where our interests align, then we can also work to support um, what you are your objectives too. Um, a second second last point, so I'm nearly at the end, but um, we're really interested in making better use of the expertise that we have. So um, there's a high concentration of financial institutions, um, insurance industry, um, tech companies, tech innovation, and so on in the UK. Um, we want to work better with these um, these actors. So that was really what I was referring to earlier when I said that we are looking for ideas. So I didn't really mean so much we're looking to understand the problems, but more to be creative with solutions um, and think more about ways, you know, how we can actually deliver effectively um, finding solutions to the problems that have been identified um, in the ABAS. And then just finally, I want to mention that our new government um, is very vocal in support of issues which are important to SIDS. So net zero, climate action, nature and biodiversity protection, um, solidarity with developing countries and working in partnership for meaningful solutions. So, you know, if you're unsure of the commitment, if you're interested, please do look at our Prime Minister's statement at UNGA, which sets out that in more detail. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. And uh, yes, I mean, from where I sit in Barbados, uh, we see very strongly UK's um, participation, for example, in the Eastern Caribbean Development Partners Group and the UK SIF and the, the, the access to the infrastructure fund um, across across the Caribbean. Um, so thank you for, for raising those important points. Um, next, um, I would like to go to uh, Gabriella. Uh, from the uh, Malta Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Kenroy. I'm supposed to have a presentation. In the meantime, please allow me, since this is my first intervention, to thank the government of Vanuatu for the excellent and formidable hospitality. Uh, just a small intro, I hail from the island of Malta. I am from the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, so I'm a capital-based expert covering SIDS unit. It's a very recently formed unit. Um, until a few years ago, it was even smaller than it is at the moment. So we've come a long way in spite of that. Um, by way of an introduction, um, I plan to go over these points more or less. We are a bit of an unusual case um, for different reasons than Rebecca just before me highlighted, and I'll be giving you some more context. First of which, our size. The writing on the map actually covers the size of the island itself, so that already gives you an idea of how small we are. Um, we are, uh, we were a SID, we were part of the group of SIDS just up until our membership into the EU in 2004. So um, so obviously that then put us into a whole new in, into a whole new perspective. Um, Malta was also one of the co-founders of EOSIS. It has piloted a lot of initiatives um, favoring SIDS, including um, the, the probably the most famous is UNCLOS, 
it was a Maltese diplomats initiative to, uh, to spell out uh, the ocean as being the common heritage of all mankind. So we've always had a very big affinity for all things SIDS. Population, 500, just north of half a million, 316 square kilometers. Probably most of the SIDS in this room are actually bigger than Malta. And we have an last, last figures were 3 million tourists in 2023. So just gives you some perspective. This is where it all started, Chogham 20, 2015. Um, as some of you may have noticed at the beginning of my presentation, there was another logo besides the one of the ministry, and that is the Small State Center of Excellence. And I know we've been hearing a lot about centers of excellence. Uh, this was another one which, has, which, which came out of uh, the 2015 Chogham, and which was held in Malta. And uh, the idea was to have this center actually um, actually working for SIDS by small island states, because we consider ourselves to be small island states. This was a bit um, the initial uh, blueprint of what we used to do. I would say used to do because later on in the presentation, I will also go a bit over how this has a bit changed with time. Um, uh, sourcing of knowledge, providing human and institutional capacity, especially in the cases of islands similar to us, where most of the time it's extremely expensive to source knowledge for just that country. So our idea was always to group as many states, collect the needs and try and source the knowledge and put it at the service of small island developing states and small island states. And also to act as a voice for small states, which obviously is very synonymous as well with, uh, with the ministry I represent. The, this was, what I, I think, one of the departure points, obviously, for most of us, um, Agenda 2030, but more importantly, I think, SDG 17, because it's pretty much sums up all we've been talking about for the past two days. Policy and partnerships came very much together. I think probably differently to most, from what I've heard from most countries, um, we did not have a document to start off with. That came along afterwards. And our initial collaborations were with different entities. Some were... Um, you know, just organic. Some came along as a result of requests. And this is more or less what we did. These are the topics we covered, climate finance, SDG implementation, oceanography, um, data negotiations for small island states on sea level rise. And this is a snapshot of the various things that we did, including, I know some of you in the room had been to Malta, in fact, for one of these uh, conferences we organized, including on climate finance. Um, we also managed to facilitate um, some big initiatives in, within the local context on uh, meeting both counterparts from Africa, but also having and hosting participants from Caribbean and the Pacific um, in Malta for technical assistance. So basically it was like a residential seven day program, full blast on training on open source data. Data which uh, the knowledge and accessing would have been otherwise more difficult to get had we not had kind of created uh, an economy of scale within, within that system. Then this happened. And that was a bit of a pivot. And this was Chogim, um, not Chogim, sorry. This was COVID. <laughs> Both starting with a C in all fairness. <laughs> and this happened exactly in that year. Malta was, uh, we had at that, at that point in time, uh, there was also a change as happens with, with most PRs. You have a change every few years. And uh, we found ourselves being coaches together with Antigua and Bermuda on the partnerships for small island developing states. So then the head scratcher began. Where do we start from? In a time of COVID, where no in-person activities were being held. So it was a bit of a pivotal moment for us in how we were reimagining things and doing things. 
I do apologize for the horrible formatting. I did not look at that bad on my on my <laughs> on my um, on my computer. So um, these are the uh, four webinars we did. We did them together with um, agencies, organizations across all the regions and SIDS, and they varied from anything between COVID. This was done. I remember in the first few months. Um, COVID nineteen across the board, um, SIDS and tourism, and the impact obviously in a post in a you know in that right in the period of of COVID, partnerships within the blue economy as well as uh, um, partnerships for SIDS in terms of renewable energy sources and water management. Then, uh, you know, a bit emboldened as well, I suppose, by 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 that exercise. We also started working a bit more organically within the Maltese context, and this is where a bit the multi-stakeholder partnerships started to really kick in. Um, and we teamed up with the University of Malta and the Islands and Small States Institute, and we started working on a SID scholarship program, um, which has been running for it's now I think I believe in the second cycle, and this is specifically for postgrad studies. Um, most of the graduates from this program end up then heading climate change delegations to COP in the various countries or as being, um, you know, diplomats in, in whatever capacity. So um, this is something that we we feel as a small island state, this is something that we can contribute um, and something which is also meaningful. Also, very proudly, uh, last year, we were also awarded the SITS Partnership Award, thanks to this program. And uh, it was it was a nice recognition to get from a from a UN uh, perspective, policy and partnerships now look slightly different to what they looked for, looked like before, and uh, um, in the middle of it, um, the foreign policy strategy has been revised, and I, I believe it's undergoing a revision as we speak, and there are actually um, also tangible uh, deliverables on to, um, to which we have to respond as SIDS, as a SIDS unit from from capital. Uh, we are working with a number of partners, including Commonwealth, um, University of Malta. We also uh, act as a bridge vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission. We work with EOSIS and we also work with OACPS. And these are all now partnerships that have been running into a number of years. Activities now look, again, a bit different. We've done, we've hosted a number of side events, including one at SITS4. Um, we've uh, also, we are currently on the UNS, uh, UN Security Council, and one of the signature events during Malta's rotating month was, uh, was an open debate on sea level rise in New York. Uh, we are also currently working on the Climate Vulnerability and Resilience Index. Um, we have spoken extensively about this in various international fora, including upcoming in COP. And I'll use this as a promo <laughs> for any of uh, any of the countries heading towards Chogem. We are holding a side event at Chogem on uh, future-proofing small states and looking a bit at what has been done, but also looking forward. And as my colleague from Mauritius has very rightly said this morning, um, since there are also so many centers and there are so many niches of excellence, the idea is we want to synergize. We do not intend reinventing the wheel. We know what it costs to do something from scratch. So instead, let's partner together. We um, we have certain areas and certain niches and certain data that we would like to um, team up with, for example, with Antigua and Barbuda Global Data Hub. And I know there have been conversations in that direction. And we hope the same thing with Mauritius, for example, with the Climate Finance Access Hub. And where there are pockets of excellence, I think, as small island states, there needs to be more of this conversation of not reinventing the wheel, but working with what we have and synergizing. This is the agenda, in fact, for the um, Samoa 2024 side event happening on the 23rd of October. We have already have some uh, very high level uh, participation. We are also awaiting some other confirmations, which Capital is chasing as we speak. And we hope to look forward and we look forward to also seeing some of your delegations over there. So 
to sum it up, what do we do differently? We have constant communication with our outposts, especially being a small uh, diplomatic service ourselves. We do not have representation in all the regions. So then we use the, the posts, the outposts, such as um, the Kingdom of Belgium, New York, um, Canberra, London, and we try and maximize this. Uh, we have worked and learned a lot from the capacity building we did, but also on what we are working for in the future and how that perhaps sometimes it's not only about capacity building, but it's about also furthering that capacity that is already in situ. Um, acting as a voice for small states, and this has stayed, I think, um, constant throughout, and acting as a bridge between SIDS vis-a-vis -vis the EU and the Commonwealth. And especially with the EU, um, I, we found that this was also something which was very missing. In fact, soon after, we have had some important conversations, even in London, to which an invite to all seats was held. Um, shortly after, the EU was appointed an EU envoy for seats, which was also very, I think, um, good and positive, because it was there wasn't just the envoy before that. Uh, yes, <laughs> they may have, yes. <laughs> and these are my contacts. I'm very happy to, to exchange further information or answer any questions accordingly. Thank you. Can I just, I forgot to plug our side event. So on Thursday, on Thursday next week, Finance and Investment for Resilient Growth, Commonwealth Plan of Action at the Supreme Courtroom, Samoa Ministry of Justice and Courts Administration Courthouse, 8 a.m. on Thursday with free coffee. Uh, thank you um, very much, uh, Gabriel and um, <laughs> Rebecca, for reminding us about the side event um, next week at Shogun. Um, and, uh, you know, Gabriela, you mentioned the important role that Malta is playing as a voice for SIDS in the EU, and we really want to um, acknowledge and thank uh, Malta for that important role. And definitely the idea of how to link up the SID centers of excellence, I think is a very good one, that you don't always have to start from scratch, right? There's a lot of good examples and experiences already. Um, I remember the colleague from Mauritius also mentioned the Aruba Center of Excellence, SID Center of Excellence. So certainly maybe one thing going forward is to see how we can connect all these various centers of excellence, even as we stand up the one in um, Antigua and Barbuda might be something to certainly look into. Um, let me then now welcome um, Mili Ojden, the founder and CEO of TreeLink, Vanuatu Trade Commissioner to California, um, uh, representing the voice of the private sector and really to give you um, the opportunity to bring your experience to some of the private sector. Thank you. Thank you and apologies for um being late. Um, I well, wear many hats in Vanuatu, um, but uh, today I'm speaking um, on behalf of the private sector, and I'll try my best to also elaborate uh, what I'm saying to apply to the Pacific SIDS, uh, if not also to the SIDS, uh, for, to all of us. Um, and uh, in terms of my uh, capacity as Vanuatu Trade Commissioner, I've worked on trade, uh, especially in the export um, uh, arena, um, but I will speak about that towards the end. Um, uh, you see here, um, these are all pictures uh, from my work uh, in the rural and also in uh, how do I uh, induct the informal sector into the uh, uh, formal sector and uh, the digitization of um, the our population in Vanuatu, which most of them live in the rural, 80% of them live in the rural, and how do we um, gather them such that they can then uh, participate in um, all the things that we care about, in the statistics that we care about. So there are several um, stories here uh, that we start from um, a really grassroots level that I wish to share with you, so that way you have a better picture of the reality on the ground. Because I myself, um, even though I've lived here uh, for, my family has been here for three generations, I will have to say, uh, I also have faults in how I perceive 
um, you know, the necessity or infrastructure that is required for development. And I'm very happy to share that with you. So here we have a, a picture above of um, the uh, uh, civic society, uh, which was a partnership in which during co uh, COVID lockdown and uh, TC Herald, we had um, no capacity uh, for the women in the rural to have any kind of uh, avenue to make money. And so um, what we did is uh, all the, we had 41 uh, villages come together to compete for a VSAT for connectivity. And these women were competing not only for themselves, but also for the generation, for their kids to have access to information and participate in the global economy. So it means so much for them. So 41 villages came together in the West Coast Santo. And uh, a lot of these women actually need to also have uh, the ability and permission from their government, uh, from their chief to travel. So it is not difficult. And they took a one day boat ride from the north part of Santo to the south. That's one day, eight hours minimum. And that's just uh, on the banana boat coming down for this chance to compete in a weaving competition. And many of these women didn't even know how to weave. So there were different villages that have to share that skill with each other so that they could learn how to weave and learn these new skills. And so here we have um, the um, documentation of uh, the different villages and who is going to win the competition. So uh, two villages won, and I believe one of the photo that was circulated around is actually from that um, West Coast Santo village in which they were not only able to get a VSAT, which is really important, but also the energy to power that VSAT. So one of the things that I, really, I was really surprised at, just like the satellite operators who would automatically assume, oh, don't you need connectivity? Doesn't everyone need it? Isn't it a basic need, a basic requirement? But one thing that the VSATs, um, the operators don't have uh, the capacity to kind of extend um, uh, their work is actually in the energy sector as well. So in the digitization, in what we need for the connectivity to fulfill the ABBAS requirement is actually also electrification of the area in which we need to be able to then collect this kind of data. So next, I will go to um, this uh, port that we have, um, and this is in Port Vila, and also in, um, uh, in Santo, we have a port as well. And so what has been really successful for Vanuatu is that we have been able to um, uh, utilize the UN's, uh, UN Trade and Development's uh, assistance um, technical assistance and also implementation of the single window with Asukuda, and also that extends to our revenue, um, uh, our customs uh, immigration with Midas as well. And uh, I'd also like to share that actually I was a UN Trade and Development um, 5G and Renewable Energy finalist. So I was really uh, glad that what we have to say for the Pacific SIDS is important enough for the um, global trade to uh, uh, recognize the innovation that comes from this region. And what that is important in this digitization is actually the, the ability to for us to maybe collectively agree that we want to maybe use a super app once we have that connectivity, we use, we invest in this super app to then allow the end user to be able to populate the data fields for us. Um, so one example is uh, the informal sector where we're able to get the woman in the rural uh, that, are, that are traditionally you know, um, farmers or micro entrepreneurs or in handicraft, how can they also record their sale, their sales, uh, but also get information about you know um, uh, logistics information, and then how can they also feed into uh, the revenue stream? So then they can then be more bankable, and also possibly be able to get insurance. Um, so that is uh, the, um, the the possibility of uh, the digitization uh, for our economy.
we have a technology we can leapfrog on. We've talked about satellites. And so we have a different array of satellite. And I have to say, uh, coming from Lugonville and because of TC Herald that has motivated me to act and found a company, 3Link, I had to, in the last four years, with no background in telecommunication, become an expert for my community. Because if I don't do it, no one's going to take that connectivity to that last mile, especially to the girls that I want to be able to have access to that uh, internet search browser to do her homework. So in the satellite communication space, we actually have a lot of operators that can compete with each other and provide us with the best pricing. And as a region or as SIDS nation, we can even talk to these global operators. Um, there are many of them and that have different technology in different uh, altitude and realms, geosats, leosats. Um, and in doing so, um, I also wanted to say that um, an important component, not only of the connectivity component, but actually of uh, the weather that, that affects our climate. So one thing that really matters to us is how do we have a little bit more notice? How do we have a little bit more early warning on the extreme weather coming our way? And though we can depend on many of the facilities that already uh, is available, um, many of the regional um, SP, S uh, SPC, for example, has a lot of uh, geospatial um, data that is available for us. Uh, but also we have a lot of clouds uh, during that time. So there's actually innovation that happens in which we, from our ground station, can also give information from under the cloud formation for the satellite providers to then have more accurate uh, weather prediction. So we can host um, also private weather stations that can also help us better monitor our um, ocean uh, that we have stewardship over. Um, I wanted to say that uh, in my um, in my uh, particip participation in the past two days, I have um, I learned so much, and I'm really inspired by the ambassador that asked a lot of really uh, poignant question uh, that says, "How do we implement?" And so um, I am being bold in my. Uh, next presentation to just give ideas, really knowledge base that I would like to share with you on uh, how I had thought about the connectivity issue um, for the youth, for the youth SIDS. And so for the Pacific um, youth, we had come up with a particular um, uh, model and we all agree that uh, connectivity is important uh, to our youth. Uh, so that they can participate in meaningful work, uh, possibly uh, have remote work, but also be ready um, in the web 3.0 in which their culture or their artistic talent can be tokenized. So we're talking about the future that doesn't exist now, um, but from my experience from the Silicon Valley, um, and also I would say um, the ability to scale uh, I feel that if we all hold that imagination and hold that objective, we can implement this. Um, so these are the kids in the West Coast Santo as well. Um, they don't have the ability to um, get books, let's say, after a cyclone comes through because all their, their uh, paper and books are uh, wet. Um, not only that, but their schools have no roof in which they're able to um, get together and learn again. So um, that is um, uh, one photo uh, that is, uh, I hope it serves as an inspiration. And uh, so this is a, um, just a brainstorming session of how I've put together a connectivity agenda for implementation. And uh, even though you look at the Pacific Ocean, you say, ah, oh, there are actually very little people around um, and there's really mostly ocean. But if you look at the, cost to actually implement uh, something that is sustainable, um, it actually really adds up because we have 14 nations, 14 uh, Pacific Cities nation, and each of them require um, 
connectivity in a number of schools. And if you add those number up for just the implementation in the number of years that's required, let's say um, now till five years from now and five years to 10 years from now, so we can do this in scale. Um, and uh, uh, so these are just some uh, rough numbers for us to kind of gauge what are we looking at in terms of cost to implement connectivity. And um, uh, here we have, of course, we're talking about schools, but you can substitute any of these particular sites as uh, uh, community centers, or you could also say these are uh, the decentralized area council in a particular country. So um, these particular sites can serve as multi-purpose uh, connectivity area for the community. And uh, one thing that the, uh, the SIDS youth also uh, really wanted uh, in the digital connectivity agenda is also to have capacity building. And um, here we have, uh, if we just build three connectivity um, uh, hubs, or uh, I would say um, a data warehousing area, um, we can substitute those sites for that. And you can see that uh, the implementation would be the first three sites might be you know north central south area and then you come back again in another um you know th uh, five years and then you implement more uh, capacity depending on how you adjust to the technology um of course uh, all the technology that we see today is has to be powered by renewable energy so anytime that you hear connectivity, a need for digitization, um, you would also have to require the energy input for that. Um, next, it is um, an example of uh, how partnerships uh, can work very well uh, in terms of implementing uh, connectivity uh, for very little money. Um, this is a project that I, um, I did in 2020 uh, during a COVID lockdown. And at that time, when I went into telecommunication, I had no idea that in the next four years, there will be four category five cyclones coming our way. So I'm really glad that we implemented this because believe it or not, these designed VSAT survived these category five cyclones, though the towers were down. So um, these, uh, there are about 500 of these sites, not all mine, uh, throughout Vanuatu. And those 500 sites were so critical for that community to uh, bounce back from recovery, uh, but also um, to help NDMO be able to fulfill um, their uh, rapid recovery. And um, uh, this is important in the digitization. I'll come back to um, how these hubs could be multi-use for what we need with um, Abbas. So here we have um, also um, Santo Sunset Environment Network. It is an indigenous a civic society NGO, um, and they um, it's it's quite special in the mountainous area of Santo, where we have really rich biodiversity and birds that are not found anywhere else in the world. So these are really precious to us, not only to us but for the for humanity for humankind, and so. In that capacity, um, SIDS, we play a very important role in uh, being able to provide very, very rich uh, carbon credit uh, in the ecosystem. And, um, and this, is, this is an example of how this partnership with uh, digital connectivity uh, plus a local indigenous uh, uh, civic society and a local operator uh, can really make a difference and push forward the agenda that we are all talking about today. Next, I'd like to talk about, um, and this is my last slide, it's um, about um, data. Um, how do we proceed forward with data? Um, because data is very particular in how we, we agree on what fields we use and what are the uh, parameters. So maybe we today uh, agree that we need to move forward with one uh, group or sector of data. Maybe it's climate data. What, what kind of environmental data that we believe it's, uh, it's shared um, a property for, for humanity or for our region uh, that we can proceed forward. And uh, because that would really help us create a baseline. 
So when there is a cyclone that comes through, do we have the baseline of what existed? Uh, what was our GDP prior to the cyclone? What was the biodiversity um, before the cyclone? What, how about the corals? How do they look like prior to that? So once we have that baseline, then we could actually measure the loss that took place. And uh, I, I would say that this is urgent uh, for our climate justice um, parameters. And uh, it is where we really, um, I would say all of us uh, really feel there's a dire need to uh, action, um, but we don't really know how to make the first step. So I um, suggest uh, from the private sector uh, that you do double up on the digital connectivity, the digital infrastructure, that then can activate all the other um, uh, uh, goals that we wish to achieve. And so in the next three years, uh, implementing that connectivity is not easy if we all agree that we are going to do it because there is, uh, I've mentioned earlier, a licensing issue uh, within the sector. So perhaps this is bold, perhaps we can have an ABUS licensing for the connectivity agenda so that we can just have this particular sector where we say for the local ISP or big telcos, if you want to participate, here's your spectrum. Go ahead and bring us that 5G for that connectivity, that broadband, so that we could use it for Internet of Things, for autonomous data collection. So we can put it into, let's say, a rainforest, and then we could hear the species that are there before and after a cyclone, for example. Um, so um, we also, once we have connectivity, uh, then we also have a higher chance of being able to conquer the ocean uh, in the horizon. Uh, we have autonomous, um, uh, autonomous um, uh, vessels, and we also have drones uh, that is within our um, ability to uh, train our youth really quickly to utilize. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Millie, and um, a, a lot of good examples of um, different kinds of partnerships, whether it's with civil society or working even with the, the, the public sector in terms of schools and improving in connectivity. And I really liked how you're connecting digitization as a what I was calling earlier an accelerator for other things. So I think an important um, practical case that could be looked at um, in terms of landing some of the uh, priorities in the in the ABAS. Um, so thank you very much for that. We'll move to the, in the interest of time, to the next um, presenter, um, and it's Juliet, um, our friend Juliet, who we know very well. <laughs> um, and Juliet, um, the floor is yours. I don't know, you, you'll speak from there or? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roach, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity once again to just share some insights from Vanuatu. And um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to be very brief, but I'm just going to focus my discussion on um, just partnerships with local stakeholders in country and, um, and how that can relate to ABAS and implementing, um, just based on some of the things that we've gone through in, um, in our activities. So I think, um, first of all, what I think is really interesting is when we're talking a lot about partnerships, it's it can be sometimes quite confusing um, and, and, and maybe a little bit convoluted because there's so many different ways and different levels that we discuss it. And so it's also really important to look at um, what levels of engagement are required and the scope and the context. So for myself as an NPF, um, I work for central government and I don't, I'm not speaking for other countries and other NPFs, but one of the things that we have faced challenges with is just actually um, working out appropriate ways of engaging with different stakeholders, um, actually determining what is the appropriateness at what level uh, and who do we consult with and on what types of activities. And so by saying that, um, you know, and I'm thinking of the ABAS, which is as national focal points, we're trying to translate something that is global, but it's also built on 
our aspirations and things that we want to see happening. It's also linked to other global agendas. And so it becomes quite interesting to work through those different layers. So when I think about some of the experiences we've had here with our um, how we have integrated the SDGs into our own National Sustainable Development Plan, I think that it's also really um, interesting and important to remember the kind of essence and, and how culture can play a really important role in, in those experiences and, and how you engage with people in appropriate manners. So for example, here in Vanuatu, our national plan um, has three central pillars, social environment and the economy, but the foundation of our plan is actually based on culture. And that's because when we did a very extensive um, stakeholder engagement program, which was six months, and we went to all of our six provinces and we um, spent time with many, many different types of stakeholders, the one resounding thing that they said was, we do not want to have a national plan that is built on something that is separate and foreign to our culture, to what we deem as our traditional knowledge, to how we manage our economy, to how we see society, whether that's through health or education, or whether that's through infrastructure, or even um, traditional economy. How does that play a part? How do you actually marry that with the formal economy? Because we have about 80% of our population still live in the rural, and so it was very interesting and also very important for that to also be brought into our national plan so that when we're thinking of all our 15 goals and how that fits in with the SDGs, but also how that fits in with the ABAS and the principles in there, you also have to take it back to what national plans say and what and how they're founded and, and where they got their basis from. So it's really important to also think about that in terms of how you engage with people. So for us here, when we were talking after um, I came back from Antigua in May, we were talking about how would we actually uh, formulize the ABAS? Do we follow the same kind of process we use for the SDGs? Um, does it mean that we have to develop something new? Can we add on? Can we take off? Can we review? And, and how do we bring in our other stakeholders um, who've been part of the SDG process with us, who've been part of our NSD process with us? And the one thing that they said was, well, you know, let's try and go back to basics. How do we actually engage those cultural ways that we dialogue and we relate to people and we interact with people? And why can't we continue to do that with the Abbas and not look at it as something separate and new, but just kind of um, bring it into the same way that we're doing it and continue to refine our processes because um, a lot of us here are male people and, you know, the normal process is you have to try something and then review and take stock. And if that doesn't work, you go back and you refine it and you keep going. And I think that's the same of, of everything in life really. Um, and I think the other thing too, uh, just building on some of the really great examples that have come from our other speakers and um, Millie is an example of that, like just so many um, existing stakeholder engagements and platforms that we already have in many of our countries. So I would just really like to encourage that we continue to build on that. And if we're not sure um, who's doing what and what areas, then really get out and talk to key people. I mean, there are agencies, we all know people, we partner with um, chambers of commerce. We have a fantastic um, Vanuatu Association of NGOs here. And our Secretary General for Van Gogh is there, Ms. Shirley Abraham. So I'm really hoping that um, if there is time and the moderator allows during the Q&A that she's able to um, just share a few insights because we've had some really interesting success stories. And I would just like to touch on uh, one particular one here, Shirley, if you'll, if you'll let me. Um, and the government through our department um, recently supported Van Gogh with a CSO mapping project where they were able to um, go through all of the NGOs that are registered uh, here in Vanuatu and do a mapping exercise to determine where, where they are doing work around all our six provinces, but also mapping their activities to our NSDP goals and policy objectives. And so for us, I mean, I, I see that as a, as a plus and, and a really good story to share in terms of how we continue to learn from working through established partnerships, but also building on that because uh, Van Gogh have said that, look, we are doing, the reality is we're on the ground. We're doing a lot of that implementation of the NSDP and the SDGs, but we do need support and capacity in terms of how we map that. And so we can kind of uh, bridge those gaps and coordinate a bit better so that we're not doubling up 
So if there's agencies that are on the ground working in uh, a certain area where the government doesn't have a sub center or there's no health center or no activities in that place, but there is an established CSO there, um, for us, we see that as a really great way of partnership and resource pooling and, and working together to implement things in a very simple way. But sometimes all you need is a map to kind of have a look at and say, oh, okay. So um, I think, um, yeah, those those are the key things that I really wanted to, to point out today. And um, I look forward to more discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Juliet, for that. And yes, we certainly look forward to hearing about uh, Van Gogh um, and the experiences uh, that Ms. Abraham will share with us. So hopefully we'll have some time in the, in the Q&A in terms of how to work with civil society organizations and how those organizations can actually help deliver services um, in places where it's not possible for government to reach. So that's a very important element in the construct of, of partnerships. Um, let's move next um, to Sasha Jetan Singh, uh, loss and damage expert from Climate Analytics, um, who will share some perspectives on partnerships. Hi, thank you, Ken Roy. And, and I'm so happy to, to be here um, and to just listen to, you know, the perspectives and lessons and experiences from the private sector and from the government of Vanuatu um, on partnerships with civil society and how, how they've harnessed civil society to actually, you know, implement and do data collection and support um, sustainable development priorities. And um, you're probably wondering <laughs> why you know, uh, um, just an organization that's called Climate Analytics. Why are they involved in sustainable development and the Abbas? And just a little bit about um, climate analytics. Um, so we're a global climate science and policy institute um, with offices around the world. And we're engaged in, you know, driving and supporting climate action aligned to the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming limits. So, you know, our focus is to connect science and policy to empower vulnerable countries in the international climate negotiations and inform national planning with targeted research analysis and support. And the Caribbean office, which is based in Trinidad and Tobago, is our newest office. And what we're doing is, you know, supporting Caribbean governments and translating, you know, the international climate agreements, international targets, policies, and governance arrangements. And at the same time, we're working with civil society, you know, across the Caribbean region and nationally within countries to, you know, increase awareness and understanding of climate change, of the climate change agreements, and also enabling, um, you know, civil society to play a greater role in participating in decision-making processes um, at, across all levels in terms of climate, climate change and climate action. And what we've noticed is that for Caribbean SIDS, and this is true for all SIDS, is that you cannot, you know, you can't separate building climate resilience from, you know, ensuring sustainable development. And I think that's, that's quite important. It keeps coming up all the time. And in, in the Caribbean, um, you know, we have a very strong civil society um, presence that's focused on climate action. But when you start talking to them about the work that they do, it's it's really also focused on ensuring, um, you know, sustainable development, core benefits, if it's related to supporting health in rural communities or energy access. Uh, or ensuring water and sanitation, right? But they think of themselves as a climate change NGO. So it's how do you bridge that gap? And that's why we realize that we have to, to consider both climate 
action and sustainable development um, in the work that we're doing mm -hmm. within um, the Caribbean region specifically. So, so that's just, you know, just in case and somebody was wondering why. <laughs> Why is like, you know, a climate climate institute involved in, in sustainable development? But for SIDS, we can't sep you know, it, it's you can't separate the the work on both issues. Um, and I think it's it's actually a nice leeway into discussing the the SIDS civil society action plan and roadmap um for the next 10 years, which was developed and launched at um at SIDS4 earlier this year. And you know, just just to give a little context about why, you know, it's important to situate civil society as a key partner for sustainable development in SIDS. And, you know, the Samoa pathway really reaffirmed the importance of engaging a broad range of stakeholders at the global, regional, sub-regional, national, and local levels around sustainable development. And it's important to note that civil society has and, and brings important contributions, you know, holding governments and other, other organizations accountable for their actions. Also, civil society is important in representing the needs of communities and vulnerable and marginalized groups. They're also involved in protecting ecosystems and also, and we feel they provide services and directly implement projects to support sustainable development and resilience in SIDS. And we've heard examples already. And, you know, it, it's because of this, having a stronger civil society involvement will be strategic to drive public policy innovation, promote effective service delivery that leaves no one behind, as well as to ensure transparency, accountability, and citizen participation. And because of this, you know, this is why it was important to develop a, a civil society action plan and roadmap to to support the implementation of the abas and um you know these are just uh, uh, you know some of the civil society participants from the caribbean region specifically who um were involved in helping to develop this um this action plan and roadmap and just a bit about this. Um, so a coordinating group of civil society across the three SIDS regions were convened between 2023 and 2024 to develop this action plan and roadmap with broad inputs from um, representatives from civil society across all SIDS region. And in the Caribbean, um, the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute, as well as the SIDS4 CSO coalition in Antigua and Barbuda, um, convened the you know the broad um, consultations and development of the plan. In um in the Pacific, uh, this was led by Piango, the Pacific Island Association of Non Governmental Organizations, and in the AIS region, um this this work was led by the SIDS Youth Ames Hub as well as the Development Indian Ocean Network. So you see, we had conveners from across all three SIDS regions, and each in each region, these conveners really focused on, on getting inputs and um, and consults, consulting with, um, with CSOs there. And the outcome was, um, was you know this um, civil society action plan and roadmap, and at at um, SIDS four, there was a special event, a civil society forum, where um, the whole the the focus of this was to foster a collaborative and inclusive approach, recognizing the unique contributions of civil society and driving the sustainable development agenda in SIDS. And it was here that the SIDS civil society action plan and roadmap was formally launched. At um at SIDS four, and this is so I have the link for for the roadmap and action plan up, and um the the main purpose of this um action plan and roadmap is to provide a broad framework and concrete recommendations for action by SIDS civil society as well as action by SIDS governments and development partners to better enable and support civil society 
to deliver a participatory multi-sectoral and whole of society approach to sustainable development in SID, in SIDS. So it's really, this is what CSOs in SIDS want um, for, for, you know, their countries, how sustainable development should look, how can they support the Abbas, and how can SIDS governments and development partners, including the UN system, could support CSOs in delivering and helping to implement and track progress on, on ensuring the achievement of the Abbas over the next um, 10 years. So there's the link. Please, def I encourage you all to review this. Um, and just, you know, a bit more about um, about the, the action plan and roadmap. So, so it's really aligned to the um, the four action areas of under the Abbas, and it recommends actionable priorities to strengthen enabling institutional frameworks, practices, and partnerships to better support civil society and SIDS to play meaningful and effective roles in delivering sustainable development. Um, and the the main, I guess, outcomes of this action plan and roadmap will be to mobilize and support collective and individual action by civil society to support the Abbas and other sustainable development priorities and SIDS. Um, it also aims to serve as a guide for governments to develop enabling institutional frameworks and mechanisms which meaningfully support and enable a whole of society approach to delivering sustainable development. And um, it also will serve as a guide for developing development partners um, which can who can provide funding, technical assistance, capacity building, and other support to really help civil society perform these important rules. And um, it could also help to catalyze partnerships within civil society to help achieve the Abbas over the next 10 years. And also, finally, it's important to note that this action plan and roadmap isn't um, prescriptive, but rather it's providing this broad framework, which can be tailored to suit specific contexts, needs, and opportunities and priorities in um, in countries. And also the, you know, monitoring, evaluation, and learning from implementation of the civil society action plan and roadmap should be in line with what is established for the Abbas, um, you know, with the pro process led by, for, and with civil society. So it's quite important to align the work that the um, IATF is doing in developing the um, the M &E framework for the Abbas with with the the M &E, the MEL for this um, action plan and roadmap for civil society. And I think um, a key lesson from the Samoa pathway is the fact that that these things happen early on, and we have you know now we have this roadmap this action plan and these priorities and um and intentions for um of civil society from from SIDS saying that this is this is the role we want to play this is how we should be supported these are some of the partnerships and you know civil society has actively come together at the very beginning and saying we are important partners we want to be part of this process and this is our roadmap and action plan and let us work together with governments let us work together with other other CSOs let us work together with uh, uh, development partners to achieve the Abbas together over the next 10 years and I think this is quite um, useful and important and it has that flexibility for um, you know, governments and for NFPs to collaborate and utilize to really harness civil society over the next decade to do so. Um, so definitely looking forward to hearing from, from NF NFPs and development partners on how we could really um, start implementing and working with civil society through, through you know, implementing this action plan and roadmap on the way to achieving the Abbas. So thank you. Thanks, um, Sasha. And I didn't know that there was the roadmap, the civil society roadmap. So that's one thing. Um, it's good to know that. 
and maybe in the uh, Q&A, we can delve into how to bring that to life through some of these partnerships that you're referring to. And maybe the panelists may have some ideas on where the points of intersection with your work already with civil society, where we can focus on, on, on um, implementation of the roadmap. So uh, with that, um, let me turn to um, Damien uh, from OHR LLS to share some of which are LLS's perspectives on this issue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ken Roy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just actually want to start with a question uh, to Millie. Uh, have you joined the SIDS Global Business Network? Okay, yeah. perfect. This is Partnerships in Action, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really glad that the GBN has uh, gotten uh, some references over the previous uh, sessions, uh, because that's exactly what I'll be focusing uh, my presentation on. Um, and I'll do that in two, essentially in two steps. Uh, firstly, I'll, I'll provide an overview of our work with uh, the SIDS Global Business Network and the biannual forum that we organize. Um, and then I'll close with uh, some thoughts on how uh, we can work together with uh, NFPs to leverage the business network in support of uh, implementation of the ABACs. I'll now just grab the... So the story of the, the, the Global Business Network really began in 2014 with the Private Sector Partnerships Forum and CIS Conference uh, in Samoa. And it was clear during um, the discussions there that the private sector was not only uh, interested in contributing to the CIS agenda, but was eager to, to have a meaningful um, and sustained presence in this conversation. And I, I would say importantly that the SIDS programs of action uh, really can be a, a North Star in terms of guiding uh, private sector engagement um, and, and partnerships with SIDS. And part of the motivation for us has always been to, to get the programs of action uh, onto the lips of the private sector, uh, both internationally and, and local. And so for, for OHRLS, um, that very first forum uh, was instrumental in catalyzing the idea of a network uh, where businesses and uh, entrepreneurs both within SIDS and internationally could gain a seat at the table and, and have a space where the private sector could collaborate uh, with SIDS governments, with international organizations, including the UN, uh, with civil society in a way that was both impactful and aligned with the broader development uh, priorities of SIDS. And so since Samoa, we've, we've held a business forum in each SIDS region, uh, starting in Aruba, where the focus um, was on public-private partnerships, uh, Mauritius, which focused on partnership, uh, partnerships in sustainable tourism, uh, in Palau, um, focusing on ocean-related partnerships, um, and a big thanks to uh, Bridge, uh, because he was really our key partner on the ground to, to organize that forum. Um, and then, of course, most recently at the SIDS4 conference in Antigua and Barbuda, uh, where we focused uh, the discussions on areas including the blue-green economy, uh, financing, uh, digitalization, as well as sustainable tourism. And coming out of the forum in Antigua, we're now working with the private sector um, and other partners to explore how we take forward the recommendations that were made by the private sector uh, in Antigua. Um, and these include uh, the creation of a, a multi-stakeholder initiative for blue-green uh, developments, uh, where we connect local innovators with investors, uh, also securing financing sp uh, for specifically for uh, to support micro, small, and medium enterprises in SIDS, also developing a roadmap to improve the business environment uh, in SIDS and, and strengthening uh, the relationships between public and private sector, um, and then also developing a, a new investment framework, uh, including uh, the use of technologies like blockchain and uh, AI. And then we'll now also need to uh, take on Canetheus recommendations uh, to create and support uh, business networks at the national level. Um, and I, I just wanna say that um, um, 
we've we've had a, a good relationship with uh, chambers of commerce uh, in in various SIDS. Um, we really engaged them in the preparatory process for the Antigua form, um, and there was a lot of value there in terms of how they came on board and helped to shape um, the program for for the forum in Antigua. Uh, so over the years, we've we've collaborated with um, and and had participation from global brands right through to small uh, and local enterprises, um, and this is just really a selection of of the many of them. Um, and for the 2024 uh, forum in Antigua, uh, we really prioritized and uh, supported the particip participation of small and medium enterprises uh, from SIDS along with representatives from uh, business support organizations, uh, as well as uh, local cha uh, chambers of commerce. Um, and I just wanna say a big thanks to um, our key financial partners as well, uh, Ireland and Denmark, uh, who sort of supported us over the years. Um, and, and that relationship has really helped to, to make the, 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 these forums a, a success. The next major part of our efforts is to develop um, and publicize a compendium of the more than 1,300 individuals uh, who are on our on our network's mailing list, um, this is a big task, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, a really kind of a big uh, next major moment for us in terms of the business forum um, and the network itself um, ahead of uh, the 2026 forum, and I'll speak to that in, in a bit uh, later. So our approach has been to. Um, consistently to seek out companies and organizations who are eager to partner with SIDS uh, to tackle real world challenges on the ground. Um, so there's many examples, but one such example is uh, we've collaborated, for example, with Parley for the Oceans. Um, the top, uh, your top left hand photo is from an event we organized with them uh, at the UN to showcase their program on marine plastics. Um, and you might be wondering why they're holding a shoe. Uh, this is, um, they essentially, they collaborated with uh, Adidas to make footwear uh, from ocean plastic that was collected in the Maldives. Um, and they also have programs uh, now uh, in other cities, including the Dominican Republic, Seychelles, um, and Jamaica. And then the second photo is another example. Uh, this is from a company called Swimsoul. Uh, which has intended past fora and, and, and showcase their unique floating solar uh, solutions for islands. Um, uh, this example actually comes from the Maldives as well. Um, and then just to say that uh, part of our work has also been to produce uh, reports and partnerships. Uh, a couple of examples that you see on the screen are from uh, recent reports on public-private community partnerships uh, in, in the tourism sector. Uh, and then another report looking at promising sectors within the blue-green uh, economy, uh, cosmetics, uh, e-commerce, and sustainable tourism. Um, and in addition, um, we've held a number of webinars over the years uh, with partners uh, on a host of topics from renewable energy through to, to ecotourism. So what does this mean for, uh, for NFPs? So firstly, um, you know, we're, we're really keen to work with you to identify and, and compile a compendium of entry points uh, where the private sector, uh, both international and local, uh, can contribute in terms of uh, partnerships on the ground that support uh, implementation of the ABAS. And I think this is where the monitoring and evaluation framework will also be very helpful uh, in, in identifying those entry points uh, specifically for the private sector. Second, um, the business network is a resource that uh, we really encourage NFPs to, to access uh, and tap into um, and, and, and to enhance you know, your engagement with the, with the private sector. Uh, the network is not just you know, a means to facilitate uh, business deals, um, but is also a platform uh, for knowledge exchange, for capacity building, uh, and potentially also for technical cooperation. Uh, so, for, interest, uh, for instance, if you're interested to leverage uh, innovative technologies, such as the floating solar uh, panels that I mentioned earlier, you know, we'd be happy to, to make the connections uh, with companies like Sw uh, SwimSol and others. Uh, and then third, I mentioned webinars earlier. Um, 
you know, we really look forward to, to having you join us. Um, our next webinar, by the way, just to plug an event as well, uh, on the 6th of November, uh, this will be discussing actually the recommendations that came out of the, the private sector uh, forum in Antigua and how we're going to work together with uh, the private sector uh, and other actors to, to take those forward. Um, and we'll be sure actually to share the details with the NFP network. And then just say um, the next business forum will be in uh, 2026 in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and South China Sea region. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're moving around the regions. Um, and we would be interested to also collaborate uh, ahead of, with, with NFPs ahead of that, uh, that forum to ensure that we ha you help us to shape the focus of that forum so that it aligns with your, your national uh, priorities as well. Um, and we would also encourage uh, the participation of NFPs or relevant counterparts uh, from your countries to, to take part and connect with companies uh, that are eager to uh, do business and partner with SID. And then finally, uh, we also heard from Garth's uh, presentation about the SID Center of Excellence, uh, which will include an island investment forum. Um, and this is something that we really look forward to, to working with Antigua and Barbuda um, to, to ensure that um, the business network and the forum uh, complements um, the island investment forum uh, and that we're all sort of aligned for, for maximum impact. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Damien. And I think um, the one one thing to discuss certainly is given the small size of the private sector in SIDS, how do we ensure that we coordinate several initiatives aimed at the private sector in SIDS? And I say that um, with the recommendation from Kennedy in mind, uh, noting that there's the Global Compact and there, is, and there are several other initiatives um, aiming at the private sector. So that's something I think definitely we need to think about in terms of partnership. How do we link up all these different initiatives so that we can ensure that um, we really um, leverage as much of the capacity of the local private sector as possible um, in, in SIDS. Um, we're supposed to have a, a bit of an interactive session now, but I, I'm thinking in the interest of time because I know that they, according to the program, unless the organizers tell me differently, at 4 p.m. we're supposed to be starting the wrap-up, but I wanted to take the two uh, discussions and then open up for uh, questions and, and comments from the NFPs and other colleagues that are here. Um, so maybe first we take um, our colleague from the um, PIF, the Secretariat, um, Vilami, and then after uh, Ms. Kalina Tapa, from uh, Tuvalu. So first, um, you have the floor, sorry. Right. Uh, thank you, moderator. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll try to be as quick as possible. So for the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, we have a number of mechanisms and strategies that we employ to engage our various partners within the region, within the region and beyond. Um, and I just uh, highlighted a few here. Uh, and just beginning with our non-state actor strategy, which really looks at our engagement with private sector and civil society. Um, with the private sector, it's really around the, the development of our regional uh, private sector strategy, uh, which will develop priorities and strategies to fast track effort on post-COVID uh, economic recovery, as well as outline priority areas to boost the private sector within the region. Uh, in addition to that, also harmonize uh, with the vision of the 2050 strategy as well and advance the thematic area on resource and economic development within the 2050 strategy. Uh, we also have a few other initiatives uh, with private sector, including the launch of the e-commerce grant facility, uh, which aims to support 30 selected uh, MSMEs to strengthen e-commerce uh, opportunities for enhancing trade opportunities between the Pacific and Korea. Uh, we also have the economic recovery project in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and this was uh, 
uh, partnership through through Japan um, with a grant provided of uh, US 1.7 million to stimulate trade, investment and tourism opportunities between Japan and 16 of our forum island countries. Um, and then in, the, in addition to that, uh, the strategy, we also coordinate the leaders dialogue between our private sector and civil society, where our private sectors and civil society from the various uh, countries are able to elevate issues uh, up to the, uh, the leaders platform. But beyond that, we also use the our non-state engagement to really involve our our civil society and private sector people in the policy development, uh, which concerns them. Um, the second part uh, is around our forum dialogue partners. Uh, and these are countries that strategically engage with the Pacific Islands uh, and contribute to discussions and initiatives aimed at regional development and security. Uh, so through the forum dialogue partner mechanism, uh, we facilitate uh, engagement with countries outside of the region uh, and look at strategic uh, cooperation, engagement, and political and uh, economic development within the Pacific. Uh, we also work with uh, our forum dialogue partners to build understanding, support, and action on the forum leaders' vision and the regional priorities. We currently have 21 forum dialogue partners, uh, and five of which is our founding members, which include Canada, France, Japan, United Kingdom, and the US. Um, the third uh, level of engagement is with our, something you would have heard of during the week, uh, the CROP agencies, which is the Council of Regional Organizations Pacific. Um, and we currently have nine crop agencies that uh, sort of are mandated to look after various sectors within the, uh, the region. These include the Forum Fisheries Agency, uh, the Pacific Asia uh, Aviation Safety Office, the Pacific Power Association, Pacific Islands Development Program, uh, the Pacific Community SPC, uh, the Secretariat for the Pacific Regional Environment Program, or SPREP, uh, the University of the South Pacific, and the Pacific Tourism Organization. So these organizations uh, really uh, have their mandated areas that they look after, and we partner with uh, these organizations to re look at uh, various pol policy areas that we elevate up to leaders. Um, the fourth uh, level of engagement and partnership is our forum observers, which include the UN. And I just wanted to highlight here uh, the crop and UN country teams, principles for dialogue and engagement, which we recently signed uh, earlier this year. Uh, so crop agencies and the United Nations country teams have established the crop UNCT Pacific Principles for Dialogue and Engagement to enhance partnership and collaboration for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the 2050 Strategy. Uh, following the first CROP UN Dialogue uh, held in the margins of the 52nd PIF Leaders Meeting in Fiji, a draft principles were developed to support and, and enhance coordination and collaboration in its implementation effort. Uh, these principles were officially endorsed and signed in uh, on 18th of April, 2024. So <clears throat> the principles include mutual, mutual accountability and respect, which emphasizes open, honest relationship and partnership based on shared norms and values, regional cooperation, recognizing the importance of coordinated regional architecture, inclusive of the Pacific Islands, inclusive approach, advocating for a human rights-based and sustainable approach with active participation from member states, crop agencies, UN agencies, and uh, 
uh, diverse non-state actors. Public goods and development, focusing on health, education, gender empowerment, social protection, interregional chain, uh, trade, climate share uh, resilience, and others. Collaboration and coordination, enhancing joint program, resource mobilization, technical assistance, and sustainable development leadership. Uh, the initial priorities to strengthen this collaboration, sorry, I'll just uh, highlight these uh, around building uh, mutual understanding, uh, which include uh, crop and UN agency open days and joint events de and developing advocacy packages and joint communication, uh, mapping existing co coordination mechanism and collecting case studies. Uh, we also have joint planning and resource mobilization uh, and strengthening joint reporting. So those are just some of the key areas uh, around this, uh, the principles that have been prioritized. Uh, so just thank you, Madri. Okay, um, hello for everyone. Um, my name is Kelena and I am the NFP for uh, Tuvalu. Um, first, I would like to thank the government of Vanuatu for hosting us and uh, for warm hospitality and also uh, UNOHRLS for sponsoring us to be able to attend the, um, the state NFP meeting. Um, also thank our panel of speakers for sharing your meaningful um, insight on strengthening um, the NFP partnerships. I would like to reflect um, and share how I, as an NFP, will work across with the line ministry on the implementation of the APAS. But I would like to share um, that in 2022, uh, my department undergone um, a restructure reform where the cabinet um, has approved uh, the reinstatement of the ME function under the Department of Planning, Budget, and Aid Coordination. So we now consist of uh, four divisions, which has a distinctive dimension that um, together establishes the um, coherent stru structure and build um, a strong relationship um, with the line ministry, local governments, and the civil society. Um, the benefits of uh, this restructure reform primarily um, improve the quality of advice to our, lead our leaders, um, greater understanding of issues within the ministry, um, a holistic view of ministry, the removal of silos, greater opportunity to provide um, input into ministry uh, policy development activities, and more res um, responsive to emerging issues. So as an NFP, I am interested um, to raise um, the awareness among my team members on the ABAS and to work on, on a mapping exercise of the ABAS in alignment to our national um, strategy for sustainable development uh, priorities. From there, I am confident that my team is well positioned um, by reaching out to and provide awareness to their allocated uh, sectors and ministries on their past and to integrate as part of their annual work plan uh, going forward. Um, ABAS is a 10-year agenda. So by looking at the key areas of uh, the ABAS, I confirm that there are a um, number of our development uh, projects which are supported by our partners are currently in progress on its feasible implementation. Um, this includes the Tuvalu Coastal uh, Adaptation Project, um, this project uh, basically focused on the land rec reclamation and raised lands, which is um, an initiative that aims um, to scale up our climate resilience, coastal protection efforts to combat um, climate change. Um, we also have the submarine cable project, which has a capital cost of uh, 42 million. Um, this is supported by uh, World Bank. Uh, um, which contribute in achieving our national uh, strategic um, priority one of enabling environments 
and achieving our national outcome one in harnessing the digital uh, trans transformation to improve lives. It is where we aim to develop an um, inclusive uh, digital economy by fostering virtual activities such as e-commerce, um, e-learning, e-government, telemedicine. And we also have a floating uh, solar panel project on our effort to achieve a renewable um, energy supply. So it is important to clearly identify and outline um, of which of the areas in the bus can be achieved over a short term, medium term, and long term. Um, the successful implementation of this uh, requires uh, both financial and technical support from our bilateral, uh, regional, and multilateral partners. So I believe that each um, seat uh, country have their own development cooperation uh, processes. So first in Tuvalu, we held a donut roundtable meeting once in every two years. So this is the high level dialogue between the government and our development partners on issues such as the progress against um, our national plan in terms of uh, delivery against the milestones, achievement of outcomes and evaluation of uh, the key sector uh, strategies and priorities for the government and the ODA uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> This forum also discusses resource um, estimation as well, progress uh, against coordination uh, strategies and the effectiveness of uh, these strategies. Uh, just to conclude, I look forward for the ongoing uh, partnership of multiple stakeholders at the national, regional, and international level for the successful uh, implementation of uh, this um, agenda. And also looking forward once the ME uh, framework of the ABAS is complete by uh, mid next year and able to uh, share to us the seed countries. Thank you. Uh, Tafa, and um, just one final intervention and then we can open up the floor for um, uh, interaction with the panel. Um, I'd like to invite the Secretary General for the Vango, that's the um, Van Vanuatu NGO Association, to just make a quick uh, two minutes intervention. Um, so thank you very much, moderator, and thank you for the organizers to invite Vango to be part of this meeting. Um, firstly, in terms of uh, partnership, I would like to acknowledge and recognize the progress, especially here in Vanuatu. Um, for Vango to be engaged in um, various activities, especially when it comes to the VNR. Vango was part of the steering committee in 2019 and also 2024, where we were part of uh, the steering committee for prepare, preparing the um, national statement. We also, I also comment the uh, Vanuatu government, especially recently uh, this year, so representative are appointed to key national thematic committee, committees, which is uh, a good step, especially towards uh, partnership. Um, for Vango internally, um, we would like to empower CSOs to be at the forefront of development efforts, uh, whether humanitarian or advocating for the critical issues that affect their communities or even apply for small grants. Um, in saying that, we have launched the CSO map recently, and we are working now on a NGO directory, which should be complete by, completed by the... Um, early next year. This is just to ensure that civil society are working in alignment with the NSTB as well as the visibility of the work in country and also um, the coordination, especially uh, the, the coordination, coordination efforts um, in the country. Um, in saying that, I would like to maybe highlight some areas of which as a civil society for, you know, for this meeting, for the purpose of meeting is we would like to, you know, see the formalization of NGO engagement, and this is to like you know establish formal partnership uh, with NGOs, especially through like annual monitoring or progress reports. The NGO should be part of this uh, a group that could uh, you know monitor the development progress. Um, also within the ABAS framework, we would like to see you know indicators that could um, help. Uh, monitor the, the progress of, you know, how CSO or uh, private sector have been, you know, working 
with the government or especially the enabling environment where we can actively do our work uh, within the civil society or, or private sector. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Abrams. Um, now, um, colleagues, we have about 20 minutes and I think it's an opportunity for us to have an interactive discussion. There are, there are some, um, we have 20 minutes, yeah? Yeah, we were supposed to have a coffee break <laughs> um, 10 minutes ago, I think. So if you want to grab your coffee and come back so we can have a working uh, coffee break, I think that might be the best thing to do at this point. So if you want to step out and come back, but I, I also wanted to um, invite any questions from uh, colleagues in the room to the panelists. Um, I have a few questions myself, but um, let me see first if there are other questions that uh, you'd like to ask. Ambassador, yes. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. And uh, let me also thank our uh, presenters for their um, presentation. Just uh, basically three things. One is the partnership issue. I think we all agree that that is central uh, in terms of implementation. And I think when we look at the Samoa uh, pathway, we spoke about genuine and durable partnership. I think under the Abbas, I think the thinking has changed a little bit. We're now talking about sustainable partnership. And what that means is, as I said uh, during my presentation yesterday, is that we as SITS need to bring something to the table to make the partnership sustainable. And I think that that is critical in terms of the implementation that we're looking at. So I just want to raise that point, put it on the table in terms of the engagement of our national focal points, because I think it's something that we should continue to think about. So that's the, the, the first uh, issue. The second one relates to uh, civil society engagement. I think there is no doubt that all of us see the role of civil society in the implementation process. But I think what we also need to consider is how that input comes into the decision-making process in member countries. Um, it's not to not appreciate and recognize the valuable contribution of civil society and other stakeholders. But I think at the end of the day, we have to accept that government are accountable. Civil society, and I don't like saying this, but it is a fact. They are not accountable to anyone except themselves. So when you look at government, when they make decisions and they're wrong, they're accountable to the people. That is the, the difference. So I think we also need to see how those input from civil society and other stakeholders can be integrated and inputted in the decision-making process. Um, and finally, this uh, discussion in terms of uh, private sector engagement, I think somebody was referring to the fact that in some of our region, especially in the Pacific, for example, we're too small. Uh, you know, it's in some countries like uh, Tuvalu, for example, it's non-existent basically. It's very, very small. So that makes 
scale a bit of a big challenge. And I wonder, therefore, uh, perhaps uh, just to put it on the table as well, whether in the cases of regions, uh, perhaps with a very small private sector, that a regional approach might be uh, more feasible rather than uh, perhaps going at it alone. So again, I'm just sort of putting those on the table uh, for consideration and perhaps comments uh, from uh, the panel, if they wish. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, um, Ambassador. I think all very important points. And um, yes, yeah, certainly I think the, the whole economies of scale discussion and taking the regional approach to private sector is important. I think this has come up several times um, today and, and yesterday. Um, and yeah, being mindful that there are many other players um, engaging and courting the private sector on many issues, um, as as was noted before. So we need to think about that. But let me, let me um, invite maybe one other comment from um, the NFPs and then turn to the panelists so that they can respond to as many of the questions as possible. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, I would like to build upon what the ambassador just said, because my question is relatively similar. Um, so I have a question regarding the implementation of public and private partnerships. And um, I was wondering if there are any examples of checks and balances or other kinds of processes that can ensure that implementation is geared towards the actual resolution of issues um, and not the creation of profit. So perhaps to put another way, you know, how do we ensure that the private sector is not infringing upon the role of government um, as we advance in these partnerships? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, I would like to turn to the panelists. Maybe we start with you, Millie, in terms of the private sector, the checks and balances. How do we ensure that government enables the private sector, but at the same time, the private sector is good corporate citizen in terms of how they contribute and um, support the development outcomes? Thank you for that. Those are very good questions. Um, I would say because we aren't many in terms of population. Uh, many of the private sector players are actually really embedded in the community, at least those that have been here for a long time. Uh, so if you're inviting international private sector, then they might be international or regional. But you know, after a while, if you stay in the, if you stay, if you are able to be solvent in a citizen nation, you know, you are there possibly for a lifestyle, but that is just an observation. Um, in terms of my answer to that is um, a very practical answer is that you need to give the private sector profit because if not, they cannot uh, plan for the future. They cannot compete in terms of innovation. So you have to trust your private sector partner because within their um, ecosystem, it's uh, quite harsh as well. So we are on the same boat in terms of size, scale, supply chain issue. So I would say um, for the beginning, uh, maybe at the beginning of a particular partnership, um, you know, clear it, write it down on the contract. Uh, but if you just say you cannot be so profitable then you will not be able to attract possibly the best innovators because the innovators themselves have to be really supported and incubated. And also because of our extreme climate, no one is immune. No private sector player within the region is immune to loss and uh, catastrophic loss in terms of infrastructure. And uh, what we want is we want meaningful partnership such that we can solve really big infrastructure problems, uh, be it digital infrastructure, be it water, be it energy, and you need profit to be able to attract that kind of uh, liaison because those private sector players also have to partner with other regional players or other international players as well. Thank you, Millie. 
And um, Ambassador posed the question on what do we need to do differently to make these partnerships sustainable and to scale them, um, which is, I think, at the heart of the of the ABAS and the and the sort of um, progress that has been made uh, between these pathway that spoke about durable partnerships to now more sustainable. So I was wondering if um, or, uh, the UK and, and Malta, if you have some, some thoughts on, on that question. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think part, um, so I just want to go back, which is kind of a relevant point. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with profit, right? So if, for these um, partnerships to be sustainable, they have to benefit all the parties that are involved. And so when it comes to the private sector, they're about making profit. That's what they do. So, of course, we don't expect executives in London to drive around in Rolls Royces on the back of Vanuatu villages or, or whatever. But I think um, profit is important. And we already work in partnership with private sector on a lot of development programming. We have consultant companies that design programs for us um, and so on and they do it because they make money from doing it but it suits us as well because they have expertise and we need people who have expertise to make the programs effective so um, so um, these partnerships which benefit all the parties then will be the most durable um, partnerships I just want to make a reflection on the on the role of civil society I mean it, it's true in the end governments are accountable and, and take decisions and um, politicians are elected and represent people and they have to sort of take the decisions but um, we are democratic countries and so uh, having the input of all parts of society is very very important so I think this consultation and input we get from all different parts of society is really crucial to make sure that we're coming up with um, with proper solutions that are effective and meet the needs of society so I really value the participation of, um, of Van Gogh and it's very important. Um, I think that at all our meetings and big meetings around this is agenda, there's always a vibrant participation from civil society representing different constituencies. I think it's very important. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I want to latch on to, to a bit what Rebecca was saying, but also to the question um, regarding how to ensure that you don't have profit at the expense of and although, and I do fully understand also the point made by, by Millie, which makes a lot of sense, I think the answer is also, though, to have checks and balances in the form of monitoring and evaluation, really. It's having that process embedded within government structures that make it make um, that in it, it's I mean, it sounds simple. It's definitely not, as I'm sure also um, the colleague from Vanuatu can very well attest. Having but those sort of principles embedded within within the system, but also ensuring that the private sector can work, so it, it's not too cumbersome, so as to, you know, to kind of have a stifling environment, but at the same time, ensure that the government is also getting the buck for his money, really, really, and truly. So it's a bit of that. As to Ambassador Lutero's um, question about genuine, you know, kind of the evolution from genuine and durable partnerships into sustainable partnerships. I would say there is one, probably um, one field rouge, one red line tying all of that up. And that would be having the buy-in of all stakeholders. Without that, nothing's going to work. It's, a, it's a, as simple as that. Who's, who's championing it? Who has an interest for it to work? If it is all parties, then there is a more of a chance that those stay, those partnerships will actually stay on and be renewed and perhaps added on and more funds are given. I mean, especially uh, I think most of us in this room work within government systems and we know how it works. You usually get a small pot of money if it works. And if the government sees that there is value, then there is more interest to have it, to have more added to it and having stakeholders putting in also their own uh, part of the budget. So it's also working within a system, not working in silos. I think this is the one thing that I feel we've learned as Malta. The less we work as silos, the more, the bigger the chances are that partnerships actually work and linger on. Thank you uh, for those experiences. And I actually just wanted to say on the issue of the civil society engagement, 
that we have seen, um, certainly as the UN across the world, many models of um, civil society organizations delivering services on behalf of governments and therefore being part of that shared accountability um, for for results. Uh, so and and also creating mechanisms um, in the context of the SDGs, for example, we've seen many governments look into different models for bringing civil society to the table so that you can get those perspectives. And I think, as um, Rebecca was saying, ensuring that the voices that are not necessarily in the decision making process, that those voices can can surface. So I think it would be interesting to think about what some of those models can look like um, as we think about the ABAS implementation so that you respect the role of government and the and the mandate given to governments, but also find a way to bring in the multi-stakeholder perspective into the into the implementation of the of the ABAS. But I'm sure um, my other colleagues have some quick reactions. Sure, no problem. And um, you know, I think it's the Ambassador Lutero, you raised an important point on accountability, because it, accountability goes both ways governments and civil society and in the civil society action plan and roadmap um you know the SID civil society actually there's a section on on actions to better enable and support civil society's role in sustainable development and um one of one of the enabling actions is you know government supporting strengthening of laws and regulations to better support nonprofit sector um to deliver on these actions um including you know having more enabling um legislation and regulation for registration procedures that are simpler um and are fit for purpose for for SIDS, um, because, you know, a lot of, of our um, civil society and community-based organizations are not registered because it's so difficult um, for these small organizations to go through that process to be able to access or be able to get a bank account to have these sort of, um, of accounting requirements um, to, to be able to access funding. So, you know, these are some of the um, the enabling actions that civil society in the region have put forward to to governments to help strengthen um, their accountability by putting in place these sorts of of legislation and regulations to enable them to better um, deliver. Um, in addition, some of the other actions have been to to um, also set standards to define what the role of civil society will be in um, legislative processes and decision making, for example. So it could be creating a formal space for civil society to engage on um, in, in, in any sort of decision making, if it's national policy making, um, legislative processes on, on um, any sort of sustainable development priorities, and also creating a, a framework for periodic formal consultation with civil society on national policies across all sectors. So these are some of the examples um, that that could help ensure that civil society is accountable um, to governments and to their the, the public and their beneficiaries as well. Um, and also in terms of data collection and that support for for this it's you know we we've been speaking about the need for capacity building for NFPs, but also noting that civil society does a lot you know already collects data and analyzes data for the specific work that they're doing. If it's on you know poverty reduction, or if it's on climate change education and awareness, or um, water and sanitation. But what we need to do, and we've they've recognized this, is capacity building on, you know, data collection methods, on on data processing and analyze, uh, you know, analysis that would be suitable um, for NFPs, for UN organizations to actually utilize the data that they've been collecting all the time. So capacity building to support NGOs to improve the quality of of the the data that they've been collecting and analyzing already. So, you know, now that data can be utilized and it is 
it's part of that accountability mechanism. So these are some of the um some of the enabling actions put forward by civil society organizations in the action plan and roadmap. So I definitely encourage all NFPs and so on to please read this and see how you could utilize and harness some of the um the the recommendations put forward um by civil society um in in SIDS moving to see how we can move forward with implementing the Avast together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um Damien, I don't know if you want to weigh in on the checks and balances question. I actually wanted to come in on something else. Em. <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to add um, uh, just a, some additional reflections on sort of the, the potential partners and stakeholders that we really need to engage to to localize the Atlas. Um, Carita referred to youth yesterday and the important role that they play. Um, you know, SIDS have really strong, articulate uh, uh, climate activists, for example, youth climate activists, um, and we need uh, likewise uh, youth Abbas activists. Um, I think education, the education sector really has a role to play. Um, and how do we get the ABBAS into national curricula, uh, at the secondary level, tertiary level, for example, um, and, and getting ministries of, of, of education involved? Uh, the media has an important role to play as well. Um, how do we ensure that you know your, your national TV programs and your radio programs are talking about the issues that are in the ABBAS uh, beyond the SIDS conference that happens every 10 years uh, where, where they're sort of focused on it. Um, and and then, of course, um, uh, uh, you know, partnerships to support uh, the very people who are going to be doing the monitoring and evaluating on the ground, the, the national focal points, um, who are the stakeholders, who are the partners that we need to get around the table to to support uh, that effort. Um, we, we know and we've heard from national focal points over the years that um, they wear multiple hats on the ground. Uh, they're covering the SDGs, they're covering the SIDS agenda, they're covering Sendai, they're covering Paris, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and capacity, their capacity to, to handle all of this um, is, is, is very limited. Um, and then just finally, um, you know, uh, how do we get, ensure that the government ministries are also, you know, sort of taking a collective effort um, and, and sort of breaking out of silos, you know, you know, the abbess might might uh, sit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Ministry of Planning, for example, and that's where that sort of the, the focus is. Um, but how would you ensure that we break down silos uh, across ministries and really get everybody on board? Um, so, yeah, just some additional uh, reflections as well. And I think in that uh, spirit, there was also the comment on sit sits strengthening sit sits partnership. Um, I think this came up repeatedly, and I think we haven't um, done justice as yet to thinking through what that looks like and what are the sort of frameworks. Of course, we know we have AOSIS and we have various mechanisms um, for shit experiences and to strategize and harmonize in terms of their approach to many of the issues that we've been talking about. But in terms of practical SIDS, whether it's in the area of, um, you know, private sector, public public private partnerships, how to do public private partnerships, what work in what works in the SIDS context, I think is still something that ha um, we need to look at. And maybe through the national focal points, this can be an area where there could be some further discussion in terms of how do you strengthen that framework for for identifying good practices from SIDS that can be implemented by other SIDS. Um, uh, to 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 ensure that the Abbas is, is finally implemented. And I don't want to lose the comment from Juliet um, that uh, came out in her intervention and she spoke about there is a need um, for building capacity of national focal points to precisely navigate and determine what are the kind of appropriate ships that are necessary um, for the implementation of the Abbas. Um, I think you were referring to partnership strategies and building partnership strategies around the ABAS that are very specific, that are very detailed so that those, um, you know, different players can be engaged in the process of engaging the ABAS. I know, Ambassador, you wanted to come in, um, final word, and then we wrap the session. Thank, 
Thank you very much. No, I, I want to make a, a point very clear. Um, in response to Rebecca um, and other colleagues, what I was referring to um, was not the actor's engagement. It was more the principles. For example, it's member states that engage with partners in terms of funding. So the commitment and the accountability is with governments. The actors of implementation includes civil society. So that is where I was going, you know, that we need to recognize that, you know. I was not sort of saying that the engagement of civil society is not important. I, I thought that I made that point very clear. But when you engage with partners, IFIs, MDPs, for example, it's government that, that negotiate. And therefore, they are accountable for the resources. But when you come to the engagement of actors to implement, that is not a problem. I'm not saying that civil society should not be involved. So I, I just want to make that point very clear so that there is no misunderstanding in terms of my comments and where I was going. Thank you. Th thank you very much, um, Ambassador, for that point. And I think well understood. Um, let me um, end by just thanking the panelists uh, and the participants for their really valuable insights and their contributions. I think um, this is a session that perhaps we could have given a lot more time to um, because I feel as though we've just started to scratch the surface of this conversation. Um, but definitely it sounds to me and it seems to me it's something that the NFPs could certainly be picking up um, when they think of once the m &E framework is in place, which is another important element in this, um, they could be thinking about what are the partnerships to deliver on the results that have been presented under the M&E framework for, for the AVAS. Um, it goes without saying that um, I think everyone agrees that partnerships are crucial um, for, for implementation. I started by saying that it's also a way of um, bringing in the means for implementation that we know many SIDS um, still need to acquire to deliver on an agenda as ambitious as the as the ABAS. So thinking about partnerships around data, partnerships around financing, partnerships around technology, partnerships around institutional development and capacities, and that came out in many of the interventions, I think would be crucial um, in terms of identifying concrete um, steps uh, forward. So with that, um, thank you very much. We went over time, but um, I'll hand over to OHR LLS. No. No. Um, thank you very much. That was that was very rich discussions, and I think uh, just when we were starting to get into the heat of things, then then we have to close at some point. So uh, now, what I'll what we'll do now is we'll 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 break for a very quick five five minutes. Um, grab your coffee. National Focal Points uh, Network meeting. Sylvain has relinquished his emceeing responsibilities. Um, has he'll be speaking in the closing, um, but don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to get up and and do uh, to spell cow with your hips. Um, there was a mystery QR code uh, up on the screen, and um, we can get that back up. Um, this is um, just to kind of invite you to uh, take note of this. Uh, so you can pro provide feedback uh, for OHRLS um, if, uh, in terms of the, the, the meeting. Um, our closing is going to be really in two parts. Um, we'll, we'll have the moderators from each of the four sessions um, really present some key takeaways um, from their respective sessions. Um, and, and I want to just ask them to be uh, succinct as, as best as they can. Uh, focus on your key takeaways, some sound bites from your respective sessions. Um, we will have a, a fuller, more comprehensive summary of the meeting. Um, and then we'll close uh, the meeting with uh, remarks from uh, OHRLS and Vanuatu. 
so as you know, uh, I think you've gotten to know our moderators over the last two days. Um, session one, uh, setting the scene and unpacking the Abbas, was moderated by Ms. Andy Fong Toy, head of the UN SCAP sub-regional office uh, for the Pacific. In session two, uh, which looked at reporting, monitoring, and evaluation of the Abbas, as well as collaboration with the UN system, uh, was moderated by Ms. Juliet Hakwa, head of the monitoring and evaluation unit uh, at the office of the Prime Minister of Vanuatu. And then a uh, big thanks again to Andy. Uh, she came back uh, to moderate session three, which was an in-depth uh, discussion uh, that went into um, uh, Abbas focus areas. Uh, and then finally, session four, on uh, strengthening NFP partnerships um, that just concluded was moderated by Mr. Ken Roy Roach, head of the UN Resident Coordinators Office for Barbados and the Eastern Caribbean. So in that order, um, I'd like to invite our moderators uh, to, to take the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Damien. Um, so when we started yesterday, which seems actually almost sort of trying to remember what we did yesterday, I think, because we've had such a, a full two days. Um, as Damien said, I moderated session one, and session one had two segments. Uh, and in the first part, uh, we discussed the coherent implementation of ABAS uh, across global processes. And it was emphasized that national focal points are essential for driving the localization of ABAS at the national level. The key components of ABIS were outlined during that session, uh, including the unique experiences of SIDS rooted in previous programs of actions, uh, the aspirations of SIDS in four key areas of sustainable development, and the 10 action clusters focusing on tangible actions. We also discussed partnerships and outcomes. The role of the UN, international financial institutions, and civil society in supporting ABIS were also highlighted alongside uh, the monitoring and evaluation framework for tracking progress. The importance of timely partnerships was underscored uh, with national focal points encouraged to integrate ABIS into national development strategies, ensuring effective monitoring and reporting. Economic challenges were addressed, particularly the high percentage of SIDS in debt distress and the need for initiatives like the Debt Sustainability Support Initiative to enhance economic resilience. The session also emphasized the importance of SID SIDS cooperation to tackle shared challenges and foster resilience. The integration of ABIS with international frameworks such as the Paris Agreement, the Sendai Framework and Agenda uh, 2030 was discussed with a focus on economic resilience, climate action, youth empowerment and disaster risk reduction. Participants highlighted the need to leverage existing regional protocols to avoid duplication and donor partners expressed interest in better understanding SIDS constraints and identifying areas for intervention. With regard to segment two, uh, the session featured a presentation on the localization of ABIS, drawing lessons from the, Sam from the Samoa pathway. Key lessons included the importance of international and regional partnerships, climate resilience, blue economy integration, sustainable energy promotion and inclusive governance. The discussion then moved to enabling factors for ABIS implementation, which include an international concessional financial support, technology transfer and stronger regional cooperation, particularly in marine conservation and disaster management. At the national level, the session focused on strengthening institutions, enhancing climate policies and building capacity in the blue and green economies. Challenges to ABIS localization were noted, including limited financial resources, capacity gaps, fragmented policy implementation, and cultural challenges. The session emphasized the importance of international and regional support, strong local institutions, public awareness, and local innovation for successful implementation. The, the session concluded with a presentation on integrating ABIS into national development strategies highlighting lessons learned from the Samoa pathway, including the need for a clear implementation framework, dedicated funding, and greater stakeholder awareness. Discussions reinforced the importance of youth involvement in promoting ABIS, and a proposal was made to establish a committee to track resource allocation and developments among SIDS. Thank you, uh, Andy. Um, and we'll go now straight to uh, Juliet for session uh, two.
thank you. Um, ironically, I'm supposed to be giving feedback on the reporting and MEL section, and I did not take detailed notes. So please excuse me. I will just um, go along with what I have all over the place here, but also um, we'll wait for the official handout to come out. So the session um, took place yesterday afternoon, and we had two parts to the session. The first part was a bit of an overview, and we had um, we had Tishka who talked to us uh, with Anya. They did a combined presentation where they kind of took us through um, what has happened, where we are, um, the fruition of the IATF, and um, sort of an outline of what they kind of can expect to do. They also shared with us a very uh, detailed timeline of where they are and what sort of the main milestone activities to reach before the deadline, which I believe is next um, July, sorry, June 2025, thank you. Um, and then we also had a presentation from um, Kenneta, who also talked a little bit about some of the um, activities that have gone through just with the processes in the lead up to the IATF. And then we also had an intervention from Mr. Chris Ryan, who's with UNSCAP online, and he spoke a little bit more about the data capabilities and what we'd actually discussed in the lead up um, to this forum today. And he also talked a little bit about the possibility of um, different methods of how we could actually develop the ME framework, how we could decide on indicators and how we wanted to do that. And there was also a brief discussion on the possibility of putting together a set of core indicators um, at the highest level that all the SIDS countries could actually um, develop other maybe sub-regional um, indicators from that. And that's something that will probably be discussed further in uh, future forums. The session uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. was um, an opportunity for NPFs to take the floor and they were able to share some of the uh, lessons learned, some of their practices that they, and observations that they've made through their process with m and &E practices, but also in how their experiences with SIDS so far. So we had um, two speakers at that time and they spoke um, about many issues, but I'm just gonna highlight some of the ones that I have down here. Um, they spoke a lot about the alignment process and just the need for SIDS countries to ensure that we're able to translate global frameworks such as a SIDS into, um, so that there is alignment with our policies and plans in country. Um, there was also a discussion around data availability and capacity and also seeking support, but also determining what kind of support um, we'd like to see from the RCOs and also um, the UN system and also crop agencies and the sub-regions and the commissions as well. Um, we also discussed elements of m and &E from uh, NPF country experiences and what that could look like if we translate that into an m and &E framework for SIDS. And we also had the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about some of the best practices and knowledge sharing um, from around different um, country perspectives as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, you'll recall that when we uh, did session three, uh, that it was an in-depth uh, discussion on the ABBAS focus areas, but particularly uh, we discussed the center of excellence, BBNJ, digitalization and shared perspectives in VNR preparation and broadly how to implement uh, ABBAS. With regard to the DSS and the center of excellence, um, we recalled that the center of excellence is a hub for data innovation and investment constituting three components. Uh, the SIDS Global Data Hub, the Technology and Innovation Mechanism and the Island Investment Forum. And that the DSSS will provide debt management assistance and solutions for long-term sustainability, and it will offer technical expertise in loss and damage assessments. Uh, and also financial planning and climate finance mobilization, and that it will serve as a model for SIDS to pursue sustainable uh, debt management. It was underscored uh, that SIDS uh, do not support non-reactive uh, fixes, but, uh, but basically supported more comprehensive support through creating a fiscal space, future protection measures, resilient investment, and expert advisory and legal support. And uh, national focal points were in, encouraged to engage with the DSSS, uh, the Center of Excellence, to leverage, data, leverage the data hub 
and collaborate to promote inclusive approaches and prioritize regional partnerships to share experiences. With regard to the discussion on oceans and BBNJ, uh, we of course are all aware of the importance of oceans for SIDS uh, with the rich marine biodiversity, which is fundamental to our livelihoods, culture and identity. And, and of course, we are the stewards of the ocean, managing 19.1% of the world's EEZs. The drive to promote sustainable blue economies, uh, digital transformation, and advancing uh, the BBNJ agreement was emphasized. And in particular, um, Bridge underscored the importance of ratifying the BBNJ uh, with SIDS. Currently, uh, there's 10 ratifications, 18 signatures, and 11 with no action. Uh, Bridge also highlighted the initiative of unlocking the Blue Pacific prosperity. We then moved on to a, a discussion on digitalization, uh, and the session underscored the importance of digitalization and adoption of digital technologies in a digital, digital world, and the reference in ABIS to the importance of digitalization. We acknowledge that the opportunities for digital transformation abound uh, with potential dividends in economic diversification, e-government service, climate resilience, uh, with digital tools in particular, able to enhance disaster preparedness and in global partnerships. However, um, the key challenges for SIDS in digitalization remain, in particular, inadequate digital infrastructure and affordability. And we were shown uh, the stats uh, in terms of the, both the uh, coverage, but also the cost uh, in SIDS of digitalization, and also the skills gap and our fragmented policy actions. So it was acknowledged that robust and reliable connectivity is a precondition for digital transformation, and that this requires improvements uh, in our ITC infrastructure, uh, not only for the submarine cables, but also in some cases, the importance of satellite and microwave infrastructure for inaccessible islands. Uh, there was a plea for technical assistance training, improving digital literacy, building digital trust, uh, and promoting digital initiatives. And of course, partnerships remain critical to advancing digitalizations in SIDS. With regard to the VNR process, um, there was a suggestion that there should be dedicated specific VNR chapters uh, for SIDS, uh, highlighting the lessons from the Sam Samoa pathway and addressing institutional and capacity gaps. Uh, and that the VNR process uh, could be used as a vehicle for funding opportunities, stakeholder coordination and evidence-based reporting. Uh, there was a call for the UN system to provide support through technical assistance, capacity building and sharing best practices, and an acknowledgement that other stakeholders such as civil society, the private sector and academia can play a vital role in advocacy and implementation and enhancing the process through the unique strengths. Uh, also an acknowledgement uh, of the reach uh, of civil society's advocacy uh, and the contributions of academia to, the, to enriching the VNR process. And so basically that great engagement and communication uh, will strengthen uh, VNRs. There was a recommendation for effective integration to include enhancing capacity building, fostering early engagement in governments in the UN and improving public awareness of the ABIS agenda. Additionally, uh, establishing such a forum such as localized SIDS National Business Network Forum can further facilitate stakeholder involvement and promote ABIS alongside the SDGs. There was also an acknowledgement about aligning national reporting to sub-regional and international platforms and partnerships with regional commissions and RCOs being important. There was a suggestion for a possible stock, stock take on what SIDS capabilities are for reporting on SIDS and that this could be taken on as part of the IATF scope. There was also emphasis on investing in national systems uh, which are built by and with the people and the capabilities and the resource context. Uh, in short, uh, you know, basically what we're saying was don't reinvent the wheel uh, and take into account the unique cultures in mind. And finally, in terms of ABIS implementation, it was noted that ABIS implementation requires policy integration and, and alignment, uh, including SDGs with SIDS specific priorities outlined in ABIS. Uh, it requires institutional coordination and capacity building. Uh, it requires uh, planning from planning to action, uh, in particular pinpointing specific opportunities to implement ABIS within the planning stages and transition to actual strategies. 
Of course, we require financing, uh, in particular, integrated national financial frameworks and development finance assessments, data monitoring uh, and reporting, enhancing data systems to facilitate ABIS monitoring and including it in voluntary national review reporting, advocacy and partnership to rally all actors, multi-stakeholder engagement, and again, regional and global partnerships that augment rather than duplicate efforts. Thank you. Uh, well, my the session four, I think was the last session. So it's the one that is most fresh in your minds. So hopefully I don't have to go through too much of what we just discussed, but um, suffice to say, I think the session, um, we had a very good panel uh, of speakers and um, most of the speakers, I think I want to start with the first, first two speakers um, in the case of the UK, a reiteration of UK's commitment to SIDS, um, a, a representation of how the UK has been working in SIDS issues, for example, uh, supporting the reform of the DAC rules, which is important uh, development assistance community but also um, being a, an advocate for SIDS in terms of uh, working and access to climate financing and providing the technical capacities that countries need to, to access the climate financing by embedding, uh, embedding advisors uh, in a number of countries um, around the world, among other things in terms of the UK's engagement with the SIDS. And then we we spoke, um, we, we heard a presentation from uh, our colleague from Malta, who, who made the point that Malta, uh, because of some of the similarities in terms of its own development um, trajectory, and now being a member of the EU, serves as an important voice um, for small states, um, that uh, there is an opportunity to really leverage the capacities of institutions, including centers of excellence in Malta and other countries to support and accompany SIDS on the journey in terms of the implementation of the ABAS and that there, and that there are opportunities around linking those capacities up um, in terms of partnerships to support SIDS in achieving uh, the ABAS. And then we, we, we spoke, uh, we heard a very good presentation on, on public-private partnerships and in particular the private sector and the role the private sector has been playing um, with some good examples of how through digitalization, the private sector has been enabling various um, initiatives in um, whether it's uh, in, at a community level uh, through access to visa technology or um, providing energy um, to power VSAT or even supporting, in some cases, the creation of an early warning system, um, and also how the private sector has been using itself and playing a catalytic role to enable um, partnerships with civil society, for example, and bio biodiversity uh, carbon credits. Then we, we spoke a bit about the opportunities around um, partnerships with civil society again, uh, civil society organizations, the fact that there is um, that uh, an existing roadmap, um, which was um, launched at the SITS conference in Antigua, uh, the CSO roadmap for ABAS implementation, and the um, fact that there are a number of opportunities that have been presented in that roadmap for further strengthening how civil society can support the implementation of the ABAS and the need to align the ABAS m &E plan with the roadmap for the CSO, um, uh, with the CSO strategy that was created at the ABAS. And then we talked a little bit and we had the perspective from the national focal points. And one of those perspectives is the importance of building capacity of national focal points to support the identification of the appropriate partnerships. And we also heard of the experience of um, Vanuatu, for example, in terms of how they brought the cultural context to the definition of partnerships uh, and the role and, and, and work done around um, CSO mapping and linking the work of the CSOs with the various pillars of the government policy and the SDG response. So a very practical example of how CSOs can work with national authorities and nationals um, with the government to respond to specific needs. 
and then uh, finally uh, discuss a bit of the Global Business Network Forum from the OHR LLS. And then one of the important recommendations, which is to look at the local level to see how to strengthen and create um, stronger business investment, business participation in the implementation of the ABAS, but also beyond private sector, looking at opportunities for creating and bringing other sectors on board through stronger multi-stakeholder partnerships um, at the national level. We ended with a very good discussion on the importance of uh, working to create checks and balances um, as you develop these partnerships and also with, with private sector in particular. And then um, I, highlighting the importance of really looking for opportunities to strengthen SID SIDS partnerships and, and using the National Focal Points Network as an opportunity for identifying effective practices from SIDS that could be adopted by other SIDS um, to, to support the implementation um, of the ABAS. So I think I'll leave it there in the interest of time, but um, that's a, a quick summary of our discussions. Uh, thank you so much to our distinguished moderators. Uh, please join me in a round of applause uh, for them. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move now uh, to closing remarks, and I would like to uh, invite Ms. Tishka Francis, head of the SID sub-program at UNOHRLLS, uh, and also Mr. Sylvain Katsikau, uh, head of the UN division at the Department of Foreign Affairs and International, International Cooperation of Vanuatu for their closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Um, Excellencies, National Focal Points, colleagues, I wish really to thank you all for your very substantive and productive contributions, including um, those very dedicated participants who joined us online, which I believe made the fifth meeting of the SIDS National Focal Points Network truly a success. I hope that the NFPs can leave here now as newly minted champions for the ABAS at the national level, at the very least. I also wish to thank all of the moderators um, of the sessions for their very useful summaries of our deliberations. But I just wanted to add a few points uh, to take away from our work together. It was apparent here that the integrated approach to monitoring and reporting is necessary to drive the implementation of ABAS and other global frameworks. And we definitely take note of the excellent feedback provided on Interalia, the need to make use of existing mechanisms and platforms as much as possible. I think that came out very clearly in our discussions and we will definitely take that forward. We also take note of the feedback on the work to develop the m &A framework, which, will be, which we will bring into the work of the IATF. In this context, OHRLLS will also provide more information on the development of the NFP toolkit for the implementation of the ABAS, which will be done alongside the work of the IATF. We also had the opportunity to develop delve deeper into challenges faces SIDS around the key issues of debt, digitalization, oceans and climate and other priority areas for sustainable development. And these discussions will hopefully inform a more ABAS focused approach to BNR preparations, as well as a general mainstreaming of ABAS into SDG implementation. Uh, we look forward to supporting you in these efforts and to take the key messages forward to upcoming meetings like the COP later this year, as well as the UN Oceans Conference and FFD4 next year. So colleagues, as you know, national focal point the national focal point mechanism provides a much needed opportunity for the SIDS to share information on the implementation of the ABAS. And this meeting also provided the opportunity to hear from our partners and other stakeholders, including the CSOs and the private sector in support of implementation, uh, particularly at the national level. And I think we at OHRLS believe this is a very important to take forward um, in the context of um, the network. And we will look 
uh, ways of strengthening our engagement strategy going forward, given our discussions over the next over the last two days, particularly around the thematic work streams that we discussed, capacity building efforts, and of course re resource mobilization. Finally, as was mentioned, we will provide a summary report at the meeting in due course, and all presentations will be uploaded to the OHR LLS website, and the re relevant links will be forwarded. Um, we hope um, the NFPs and all participants can take back the important messages shared here to their respective ministries, organizations, businesses, and other entities. And I, I believe we already um, put on the screen um, a, a link to the um, evaluation form, but we will also share that electronically. Um, and we would request that you please fill that in and return it to us as soon as possible. Um, this will be an important tool for us um, to get your ideas on how to improve the effectiveness of these meetings and our work more broadly. So as I conclude, I, on behalf of the OHRLS team, including the USG and High Representative who couldn't be here with us today, I wish to thank you all so very much again for the useful discussions and for your active participation. I would also like to thank the technical staff um, who have so ably supported our meetings. And last but not least, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the government and people of Vanuatu for so graciously hosting us. A special thanks goes to my friend Sylvain and Juliet. Well, I met Juliet just at this trip, but I think we became fast friends. So thank you so much to you and your teams for your tireless efforts um, to make this meeting a success. Um, it is truly appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for those um, very kind words. Believe it or not, we are going to conclude this meeting three minutes, 52 seconds before the scheduled time. <laughs> We're advancing here. Yeah. Um, excellencies, NFPs, uh, distinguished participants, on behalf of the Vanuatu government, it has been our absolute pleasure hosting the fifth SIDS National Focal Points Network meeting. We again wish to thank the OHRLS team led by my dear friend Tishka Francis for putting together the meeting program and for their stellar efforts in bringing you all here. Uh, we thank all of you NFPs, uh, experts, representatives from uh, diplomatic missions, UN offices, agencies, funds and programs, MCOs, civil societies and NGOs, private sector, and of course, government officials for attending uh, the meeting and adding to the rich discussions. We are pleased with the way discussions uh, went despite the technical glitches we experienced in the beginning. So please forgive us if we um, fell short of your expectations. As our Honorable DPM mentioned, um, we hope that you will uh, return to your respective homes um, empowered and invigorated to help guide national uh, implementation of ABAS through practicable, um, pr practicable and tangible actions using your own development processes and through a holistic approach. For those whose um, journeys end here, we wish you safe travels uh, back to your respective homes for those continuing uh, on with the side visit and the Blue Lagoon uh, swim, we will see you tomorrow. Despite the weather, we will go. Um, for those, um, I wish to uh, thank uh, uh, the preparations committee here and on the ground, chaired by my very able uh, good friend, Ms. Juliet Hakwa, for the tireless efforts with the logistics. I truly have a great team and I appreciate them so much. I also want to thank the technical team led by the Brech uh, Pacific for uh, um, guiding us through this and en enabling our uh, colleagues who are not able to be here to join us in this meeting. Now, on behalf of the Vanuatu government and OHR LLS, my friend Tishka and I have now jointly declare the official part of the fifth meeting of the SIDS National Focal Point closed.
Thank you.